The Tulip Touch by Anne Fine, read by Sophie Aldred. Part one. You shouldn't tell a story till it's over, and I'm not sure this one is. I'm not even certain when it really began. Unless it was the morning Dad thrust my bawling brother Julius back in Mum's arms and picked up the ringing telephone. The palace? Why ever would they want me at the palace? Anyone listening might have begun to think of royal garden parties or something. But even back then, when I heard people saying things like, the black horse or the palace, I got a different picture. And that's because I've lived in hotels all my life. I don't even remember the first one, the old ship. Mum says it was small and ivy-covered, with only six bedrooms. Then Dad was manager of the North Bay, and later he was moved to the Queen's Arms, where we were living then. So what's the palace's problem? He listened so long and sighed so heavily that Mum had looked up from trying to placate Julius with his favourite furry rabbit, even before we heard Dad say, All right, I'll drive over, just to take a look. I don't know what time he got back, but it was late. Our flat was above the kitchens, and the huge extractor fans had stopped humming. The only sounds left were the usual muffled telephones and scurrying footsteps. At breakfast, he said to me, You ought to see it, Natalie. It's enormous. It's got over sixty bedrooms, and it sits on its lawns like a giant grey wedding cake set out on a perfect green tablecloth. When can we come? He glanced at Mum, worn out from another bad night with Julius. Soon, before I finish there, I'll take you over for the day. But when we finally saw it, it wasn't for the day. It was with suitcases and boxes and bags. Oh, I'm sorry about this, Dad kept saying. I really did think this was going to be a short job. Mum tried to resettle Julius in the hot crush of his car seat. He squawked and struggled. And, tense from the packing, she complained the whole way. A few lumps of plaster falling in the guest's hair, you told me. Three weeks at most, till all the ceilings were fixed. And now it's wet rot and dry rot and problems with the piping and the fire doors. Why can't the old manager cope? He's the one who let it all happen. Dad knew there was no point in answering. He just drove. One man not up to his job, Mum grumbled. And suddenly three weeks is three months and Natalie has to come out of school a week before the holidays and... We swung round the last bend and she broke off. Before us stood the palace, vast and imposing, silencing petty complaints. Dad switched off the engine and Mum scrambled out. Julius immediately stopped struggling and fell quiet. Mum unstrapped him and lifted him into her arms. And as she carried him up the wide stone steps to the palace, suddenly behind her the whole sky was ablaze, and on the lawns on either side of her the peacocks spread their glimmering fans. See, Dad whispered to me, triumphant, a good omen. But I felt differently. I felt so strange. I think I must have been dizzy from the ride. I stumbled out of the car, and suddenly the sky seemed too high above me, the grass too green, and then one of the peacocks let out the most unholy cry, and I was filled with such unease. Everyone thinks they can see things when they look back. It's nonsense, really, I expect. Forget Dad counting the bedrooms, the palace had over a hundred rooms, if, as well as the lounges and dining rooms and bars and verandas, you counted hot attics and dark cellars. 
In less than a week, Dad had the last few stubborn guests shunted off. Then, within hours, some floors were taken up, some ceilings down, and I was living in a strange new world, peopled by men in overalls. Dad strode about sorting out plasters and making arrangements for work to start on yet another floor. Every so often he'd remember me, and the cry would go up. Where's Natalie? Anyone seen her? If nobody had, then he'd panic. Natalie? Can you hear me? Natalie! The shouts would echo through cavernous rooms and up lofty stairwells. Natalie! Natalie! Till one of the workmen spotted me arranging dusty glasses in rows like soldiers on the copper cocktail bar, or cartwheeling across the empty ballroom, or leaning over till my panties showed as I peered in cracked urns on the terrace. There she blows! Perfectly safe! I spent the summer skipping down corridors that had their carpets rolled and holding endless imaginary conversations with the stone boy in the lily pond. For weeks, the palace seemed more chaotic each time I picked my way down one of its great swooping staircases. Then suddenly, the order was reversed. Day by day, dust sheets were whipped off tables and armchairs and sofas. Drills went back into tool chests, and cleaning began, till even my favourite gold cherubs over the mirrors glinted at me one morning, gleaming and bright. Then, off to catch a pet mint from one of the painters, I heard Dad taking a call. A south-facing double room. Oh, yes, indeed. And dinner on both evenings. Thursday and Friday next. I hurled myself at him, barely managing to keep quiet until he'd replaced the receiver. Is it opening again? Is that it? Are we going? Wincing, he reached down and lifted me onto the polished brown sea of the reception desk. He looked over his glasses at Mum, who'd been sorting out keys in the corner, and she sighed and gave a tired little nod. Natalie, he said gently, I'm afraid we've got something rather awkward to tell you. Stay, I said, wide-eyed, when I finally understood just what it was they were trying to explain. Stay in the palace forever? They started to comfort me. How could they have known so little? How could they have got it so wrong? It had been my one dream all those long, long weeks. To stay, to somersault endlessly down the wide slopes of clover-studded lawn, wander at will through drawing rooms, writing rooms, boathouses and conservatories, bounce on the cherry-red sofas, pick my way like a gymnast, toes pointed, arms outstretched, along the stone ledges of the terraces. Natalie? I stared at them. Natalie, sweet, you don't mind, do you? You won't pine for old friends. You will be all right. I nodded at them, dumb with joy. had a hard time with the two of us when Julius was little. She'd say, I feel sick with tiredness, and give Dad one of her pleading looks. And, if he had the time, he'd take me off across the lawns, through the rose garden, and then down the narrow, twisty path that led through the dark belt of trees. It almost hurt to step out again into the brightness of the open field. And that's where we first met Tulip still as a statue in the sea of corn. Is that a scarecrow? Dad peered against the sudden glare. No, I do believe that it's a little girl. What is she doing out here all alone? Dad shrugged. We'll ask. He took my hand and called across. Hello? Hello? She turned to face us, and I could see that she was nursing something. Is that a kitten? I was off in an instant. The palace had stuffy old cats, 
but a kitten. Bliss! Dad roared after me. Natalie, think of the crop! And I came to a halt. Even I realised the farmers were our neighbours and must be friends. So I stood burning with impatience while this stranger my age stepped carefully towards us, spreading the corn with her free hand and picking her way so gently that by the time she reached us, I couldn't see a sign of the track she had taken. The kitten's eyes weren't even open yet. What's its name? What are you going to call it? Dad touched my shoulder. It would be more polite, Natalie, to ask the young lady her name first. He looked at her expectantly, but she just tossed her unbrushed hair out of her eyes and stared as if he'd dropped from outer space. Dad tried again. This, he said, patting me, this is Natalie, and uh, <clears throat> I am Mr Barnes from the hotel. Again we waited, and then finally, Tulip, she said. I couldn't believe that was her name. I thought she must mean the kitten. And sometimes I wonder if that's the reason I dropped everything to run across and say hello to her a few days later when she appeared at the edge of the playground. Because, still almost a stranger in my new school, I couldn't miss the chance to say something so silly and bold. Hello, Tulip! She stared at me, and I faltered. The silence between us grew. And then... Too embarrassed to come to my senses, I added the really stupid bit. Do you want to be friends? I paid for the privilege, if privilege is what it was. Nobody else would have Tulip in their gang. They knew from experience that she was out of school more often than in. That's why I'd never seen her. From that day on, I spent countless hours scuffing alone round the playground, desperately hoping that she'd show up or that some soft soul in one of the busy swarms of children whooping round me would crack and say the words I longed to hear. Forget silly old Tulip. She's never here anyway. Come and play with us. I look back and think I must have been mad. What sort of friendship is it when one of the pair is hardly ever there and the other is never permitted to go off and find her? On this, my father was adamant. I'm not even discussing it, Natalie. You are not going over to Tulip's house. She can come here as often as she likes, but you're not going there. And that is final. Why was he so firm about it? What had he seen that first day that made him so convinced the Pierce's farm was no place for a daughter of his? Most run-down small holdings are ringed with disemboweled machinery. Most small-time farmers keep frustrated dogs chained up to bark at every passing sparrow. And we didn't meet Tulip's parents. For all Dad knocked and knocked, no one appeared. A dozen times a week I'd say to him, Let's go back and try again. I haven't seen her for days. I probably won't see her again ever at this rate if I can't go and find her. No. Maybe she's ill. I doubt it, Natalie. It's not her fault her parents don't think school's important. If I were you, I'd make some other friends, because nothing's going to change here. You are not going to be allowed to go to Tulip's house, and that is that. Was I just being stubborn? What sort of magic did she have for me? All I know is, I never made the effort to find another friend. I didn't even put myself out to steal enough good things from the kitchens to wheedle my way into one of the school gangs. Instead, I stayed aloof, and during evenings and weekends I floated round the palace, presumably content with the glancing interest of bored guests and my own company, till I'd see her standing on the edge of the lawns. Then my heart leapt up, and across I'd fly. Tulip, where have you been? It's been ages! What do you want to do? We did everything. We went everywhere. We were called in from lawns and potting sheds, shrubberies and terrace gardens. When the cold weather came, they'd look for us in lounges and coffee rooms, alcoves and blanket stores. 
Sometimes it was awkward to come out, because for the last hour we'd been wrapped in the folds of the plush ruby curtains, eavesdropping on some unwitting pair of bickering guests. But mostly we'd appear soon after we heard the determined footsteps and the call. Time to go home now, Tulip. Can't I stay? Your parents will worry. It wasn't true. If Tulip's parents worried, they'd have shown up a dozen times before, when no one had even realised she was still with me till I was ordered off to bed. But Dad would keep a straight face. So would she. Can I come back tomorrow? If you like. Maybe she would. Maybe she wouldn't. I'd be waiting, whichever. Sometimes Dad would notice me drifting round in a trance of solitude, and realising how busy he'd been lately, offered to take me fishing. We'd set off in the quiet hour after lunch, and there she'd be, hanging around the field end of the walk through the spinney. You can send her home if you like, I'd say softly, stung that she hadn't bothered to show up for me. But he'd greet her as cheerfully as usual. Coming along? She was no good at fishing. Dad said that everything swam off the minute it saw her shadow. He'd catch one thing after another. I'd do all right, and she'd get nothing. But she seemed happy enough, and so did he. He never seemed bored on the afternoons Tulip came. What was that game you two were playing yesterday when Mrs Scott Henderson complained about the noise? Rats in a firestorm. Did you find somewhere more sensible to play it? She grinned. We moved down to the cellars and called it Hogs in a Tunnel instead. He shook his head. <laughs> Very pleasant. Though I suppose it's still less of a bother than that game you were playing all last week. Which? Fat in the fire? It was malaria most of last week, I reminded her. Why can't you invent some quiet ones? I don't invent them, I told him. Tulip invents the games. He turned towards her. So, he said, how about it, Tulip? She cocked her head to one side. There's Road of Bones. That's very quiet. And we played Days of Dumbness quite a lot. No noise at all in that one. He shuddered. Days of Dumbness? Road of Bones? Don't the two of you ever play anything pleasant? She was grinning again now. I suppose you played things like happy families and tickle the baby when you were young. Yes, he said. That's the sort of thing we used to play back in the good old days. She gave him her flirty look. What's the worst thing you ever did, Mr Barnes? When I was a child, she nodded. If I'd asked him that question, he'd never have given a sensible answer. But Tulip could make Dad talk about anything, and he fell quiet, thinking. The thing I feel worst about, even after all this time, is dropping my grandfather's tortoise on the garden path, he told us finally. I didn't have the guts to go and tell, so I just shoved it out of sight under the nearest bush. He still looked uneasy, remembering. How old were you? I asked. Eight. Twenty-seven years ago. Did it smash? Tulip demanded. The word she chose repelled him, you could tell. He picked a different one, with care. Its shell did crack, yes. Was it an accident? Of course it was an accident, he said sharply. You don't suppose I threw it? No, she said hastily. There was a silence. Then Tulip said, You should have put it in the freezer to kill it. Dad's face was a picture. It's the kindest way for fish and terrapins, she assured him. Probably for tortoises as well. He'd forgotten his fishing line. He was staring at her now. Tulip, how would you ever know that? I suppose I just heard it somewhere, and remembered it. Dad turned to me. Did you know? I wanted so much to say I did, but Tulip would have known I was fibbing. 
No, I said sullenly. He turned back to her. And do the things you hear worry you? No, she said. Sometimes I think about them for a bit, but mostly I'm interested more than I'm worried. There was a flurry underneath her float. Is that a bite? he asked, happy to be distracted. Have you been lucky for once? Is that a bite? No, she said, not even looking. No, it's not. I did go to her house, of course, but only once. I can't remember what fired me up that I should be brave enough to sidle to the edge of the lawn, then so casually slip out of sight in the shadows. Those huge overhanging trees must have given a sense of foreboding to the venture. But I didn't falter, and out in the sunlight again, stayed on the far side of the fence till I was beyond the view from the highest palace window. Hotels are filled with bored people. You can always be sure that whatever you are doing, there will always be somebody standing and watching. I hated Tulip's house. It wasn't just that the carpets were stained and the furniture battered. It was that Tulip herself seemed different, just a shell, as if she had slipped away invisibly and left some strange, strained imitation in her place to say to me, Want another biscuit? Or, what shall we do now? Shall we go in the yard? I wanted to get out of the kitchen. Tulip's mother was giving me the creeps with her beg-pardon smile and her tireless, tuneless humming, as if in that horrible, smelly, sunless back room she'd completely forgotten a song was supposed to have a melody, let alone a beginning and ending. Hearing that awful, interminable drone was like listening to a robot pretend to be a person. The backyard had clumps of weeds waist-high, but there were far too many smashed bottles lying about for us to play most of our creeping games. So in desperation I said, Let's go and find your kitten. She looked at me blankly. Well, I corrected myself, feeling stupid. Cat by now. We don't have a cat. You were carrying one the day I met you. Her eyes went pebble hard. I expect I had to give it away. I knew she was lying. So in my eyes, of course, it was a merciless cat killer I met when retreating from the unpromising yard, we came face to face with Mr. Pierce striding in through another door. I watched as he filled a cracked cup with water, drank it down, refilled it, drank more, then turned back from the sink. His eyes came to rest on me, and never moved, till I snatched up my jacket and burbling excuses rushed away. I'm sorry I had to go like that, I said to her next morning at school. I suddenly remembered I was supposed to... And off I went again. Burble, 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 burble. Tulip looked cross and bored until I stopped. Then she said, Dad's all right when you're used to him. But I had no intention of giving him even one more try. From that day on, I stopped nagging Dad about letting me go there and used the excuse he had taught me to save Tulip's feelings. They won't let me near dogs like Elsa, and stayed away. And I saw lots of her at school. She had no other friends. Nobody else could stand the embarrassment of pretending that they believed her awful lies. The army's borrowing one of our fields today. When I get home, they're going to let me drive a tank. Oh, I really believe that, Tulip. So likely. They'd walk off, scoffing. I'd stare at the ground. And guess what? I'd feel sorry for her. I knew she was making a fool of me in front of everyone. 
Only an idiot would make a show of believing her rubbish. But instead of just walking away exasperated like everyone else, I'd try taking her arm and distracting her. Want to play Road of Bones on the way home? She'd shake me off, rude and ungrateful. Even back then I had to ask myself why I stayed around. It wasn't out of pity. I knew that. Nobody has to carry on telling ridiculous lies, even after it's obvious that no one believes them. I've won a big competition. I found a scratch card in my cornflakes, and I was lucky. So now I've won this beautiful yellow silk dress. Next time we bought sweets in Harry's supermarket, I'd linger by the breakfast cereal shelves. There's nothing about a competition on any of these packets. No, it was a scratch card inside. Strange that no one else got one. They only sent out a few as a special anniversary thing. That's why the prize is a yellow silk dress. It's the very same one that the model wore in their first advert. That's what Dad came to call the tulip touch. That tiny detail that almost made you wonder if she might, just for once, be telling the truth. And then this man went grey and keeled over, and as I was phoning for the ambulance, his fingers kept twitching, and his wedding ring made a tiny little pinging noise against the metal of the drain. So I wasn't at school because the police needed one extra person my age and size for a line-up. They wouldn't say why they'd arrested the girl, but one of them did tell me that he thought she was Polish. Ah, Dad would murmur in unfeigned admiration. Polish, the perfect tulip touch. She'd give him a pained wooden stare. Sorry? Nothing. He'd turn away, of course, to hide his grin. But I'd be left to see the look of venom on her face. Tulip loathed being teased. It was as if the moment these stupid stories were out of her mouth, she believed them completely, and anyone who queried even a tiny part of them was going to be her enemy and hated forever. So it was Dad, not me, who risked a bit of mischief a couple of weeks later. So where's the great yellow dress, Tulip? How come you haven't brought it round to show us yet? She looked surprised. Didn't I tell you? I had it ready in a bag... Then Mum knocked over a bottle of bleach and some got on the sleeve. So she's posted it off to a big firm in Chichester that does a lot of mending for the royal family to see if they can patch it from the hem. Dad watched her, spellbound. Once she was gone, he turned to Mum. Poor little imp. What sort of squashing must she get at home to think she has to make up all this stuff to impress us? Mum just said irritably, You'd think she had more than enough brains to know better. And you would, too. She was miles cleverer than me. If it weren't for her missed days and undone homework, she would have beaten me in every test. But even in good weeks, Miss Henson had problems with Tulip. Please try and settle down. You're distracting everybody round you. Now, that's not what I told you to do, is it? Tulip, I warn you, I have had enough. If she'd spoken to me that sharply, I'd have died of fright. But Tulip didn't care. A moment later, she'd be rushing out of her seat across the room. I can see Julia's rubber on the floor! And a minute or so later, Now I'm going across to help Jennifer with her project. There was a plaintive and immediate wail. Stop her, Miss Hanson! I don't want her help! Out came the tongue. Tulip's not Jennifer's. Tulip! Back to your table. Sit down and stop being such a nuisance. I sat so quiet, I was hardly there. That's why she left us side by side, I expect, so I could water Tulip's fidgets down. But somehow we went together well, and things worked out. We were the triangles in primary band. We shared counting the lunch money two months in a row. Though, now I look back, I realise that was probably Miss Henson's way of getting the job done properly through Tulip's month of office. And we were the ugly sisters in the Christmas play. 
At first, I could tell both Miss Henson and Mr. Barraclough were deeply dubious about giving Tulip the part she begged for so piteously. I have to warn you, Tulip, if you miss more than a couple of rehearsals, we'll have to take the part off you. So are you sure? She nodded vigorously. And I must have a note from your father saying he won't mind you coming in for the evening performances. Tulip's keen look turned sour. Nobody else has to bring in any note. Miss Henson sighed. I'm sorry, Tulip. It's just that Mr. Barraclough hasn't forgotten yet. When she'd walked off, I asked Tulip, Hasn't forgotten what? Last time, before you came, I was a dancing bean. Was it difficult? It seemed the best way of asking what went wrong. I did it fine, she said. I learned the song, I knew the dance, but then something came up, so I couldn't do it. I'd been fobbed off with that something came up too often myself, but in the first flush of being her ugly sister, I felt generous. You'd think he'd want you to have a good part this time. She executed what I could only take to be a short snatch of bean dance. It wouldn't have mattered so much except for the others. Others? The other beans. The dance was a bit complicated, you see, so they couldn't do it without me. Oh. I had a sudden vision of everyone trying to get through the big night with only one ugly sister. Me. But in the end, there wasn't any trouble. Her mother sent in the note, Tulip showed up every day that we had a rehearsal, and she and I turned out to be the stars of the show. Tulip's witchy foot-stamping frenzies and my vacuous no-one-at-home stare were far more fun to watch than Prissy Cinderella's tears. Three evenings in a row, we got the loudest laughter all the way through and the longest applause at the end. After the last show, I was so forlorn, I refused to let anyone take off my makeup. Oh, it rubbed off overnight on my pillowcase, and Tulip had to hand in her frizzy green wig in the morning but no one could wipe the performance out of us. Will you two stop lolling against one another? If you don't, I shall separate you. Natalie, don't nudge Tulip when you know the answer yourself. You're not a dummy. Put up your own hand, please. Tulip, she's not a puppet on a string. Just because you need to go, it doesn't follow that Natalie has to go with you. Halfway through January, Miss Henson finally moved us apart. We wailed and fussed. It isn't fair! We weren't being naughty! We were just being sisters, like in the play! Hard cheese, she said brutally. I'm afraid that was last year. And that, of course, set off the next game. That was last year. The silliest remark would set it off. Marcy can't find her gloves. No, that was last year. She's looking for her panties now. Have you seen Miss Henson's new car? That was last year. She came on a broomstick this morning. They were so stupid and unfunny, we only whispered them. But still they sent us into such spasms of amusement that the others would gather round us in the playground. What's the big joke? Nothing. We'd stick our knuckles in our mouths and snigger some more. Oh, leave them. They're just being silly. And so we were. So silly that before I realised what was happening, the taint of unpopularity had thickened and spread. Oh, please don't make me sit by Natalie. She just giggles all the time and makes faces with Tulip. I'm not sitting with her either. Miss Henson caught the flu. Her father had to go to hospital and everyone she tried to seat us beside put up a really hard fight. It's strange to think that we go down whole different paths because of accidents in other people's lives. My friendship with Tulip could have been derailed, or at the very least diluted a little. But flu, a broken hip, a bit of squawking round the class, and she gave up. All right, then, if you promise to behave yourselves, I'll give you one more chance. Just one.
were we like then, the pair of us, Tulip and Natalie? I lift a photograph out of the box and see us laughing. We look happy enough. But do old photos tell the truth? Smile, someone orders you. I'm not wasting precious film on sour faces. And so you smile. But what's behind? You take the one Dad snapped by accident when Tulip came down the cellar steps just as he was fiddling in the dark with his camera. Suddenly the flash went off and he caught her perfectly, if you don't count the rabbity pink eyes. She's a shadow in the arched entrance of that dark tunnel. And how does she look in that? The only one to be taken when no one was watching. Wary, would you say? Or something even stronger? One look at that pale and apprehensive face, and you might even think, haunted. But there's something else that springs to mind. I turn the photo in my hand and try to push the word away, but it comes back at me time and time again. I can't get rid of it. If you didn't know her better, you'd have said she looked desolate. And yet, Tulip loved the palace, every inch of it. I'd watch her endlessly running her fingertips along the swirling banisters and gritty stone ledges and dimpled bar tops, as if by sheer touching she could make the whole place hers. Natalie, you're so lucky. I'd shrug. I knew it, but it seemed rude to agree, as if, in admitting it, I'd be halfway to saying that I would have gladly died a thousand deaths rather than swap my life with hers. And these days, Tulip rarely hung around the cornfields. She came as often as she could, sucking up to Mum, flirting with Dad. Good morning, Mr Barnes. Morning, Tulip, my flower. But I do have to warn you that no one gets late breakfast in this hotel, even here in the kitchens, without first settling with the manager. What's the price today? Let me see. It's Saturday, isn't it? And high season, so I'm afraid it's going to be a hug and three kisses. She'd count the kisses out onto his cheek. One, two, three, and the hug. There. Right, he'd say, now that you've paid, you must have another sausage. He'd flip it onto her plate, his party trick. But she'd be watching... Not the arc it was making through the air, but the sausage itself. For Tulip loved the food. I was forever losing sight of her for a few minutes, only to find her in the kitchens, her mouth stuffed with something she'd already begged, staring at treats to come, the creamy trifles and the chocolate roulades, the cherry meringue pies she loved above all else. Want to come up to the toy room? In a bit. A few minutes later, she'd trail up the last of the steep wooden stairs and join me, rooting through the drifts of games and toys abandoned by guests at the palace. We had a craze on the pogo stick and learned to fly the battered kites. Tulip mastered the fretwork saw, and we even had short passions for the faded old sewing cards and the prissy little flower press. What do you think? Dress-ups? The trunks were brilliant, spilling with feather boas and muffs and tunics with military frogging. Do you suppose the people who owned all these really old things are dead? I held my favourite taffeta frock against me. They must be. Most things get sent on now. Dad says he spends most of Tuesday posting packages to careless people. She jammed a brown felt hat down hard on my head. Now you're Miss Henson's mother. I threw a velvet cape around her shoulders and handed her a tattered parasol. And you're Mr. Barraclough's great-aunt. We minced round the attics in our ill-fitting high heels. Did you see my nephew's splendid recent production of Cinderella? Indeed I did. And did you notice those two astonishingly talented young actresses, Tulip and Natalie? I thought that Tulip was by far the best. I preferred Natalie. No, Tulip. Natalie. Tulip!
We fell wrestling onto the heaps of old clothes, my nose filled with the stink of mothballs. <sighs> Even Stevens, I panted. She let go of me. Even Stevens. The hours spun past. Time had two speeds for me. The racing kaleidoscopic tumble of days spent with Tulip, when the first of the peacock's blood-curdling evening shrieks made me look at my watch with astonishment. And then the endless drag of days alone, when only a few miserable minutes crawled by between each desperate inspection of the clock. There was scant sympathy at hand. If you're bored, play with Julius. I'm not bored. I was, though. Not bored enough to play with my brother, but bored enough to feel that every minute spent away from Tulip was not real living, just a waiting time. Well, play with Julius anyway. And so I did. Sometimes with good grace, sometimes with bad but always feeling that there was something missing, and that the real day I should be having was taking place somewhere half a dozen fields away, beyond the spinney, with Tulip. She bought Julius a plastic toad for his birthday. We stood in front of it in the charity shop. It's a bit scratched, she worried. He won't mind that. He probably won't even notice. You don't think... He'd prefer something furry. No, I think he'll like this. Like it? He fell in love. He instantly named it Mr. Haroon, after a recent guest who'd spoiled him rotten and carried it round all day. One of the Austrian ladies staying a week persuaded her sister to lay aside the rose tapestry she was working on and run up a sort of baby backpack that kept Mr. Haroon safe but left Julius's hands free. Everyone who passed through the palace admired the way the backpack was designed, and Julius inevitably pointed to Tulip. She gave it me. Guests would fall over themselves to congratulate Tulip on the backpack's design, the silk lettering, the beautiful stitching. Tulip soaked up the praise, grinning modestly and flapping her hands in an embarrassed fashion. It never bothered Julius that Tulip was accepting compliments for someone else's work. Why should it? To him, only his precious toad mattered, and Tulip had definitely given him that. But what is strange is that it never bothered me. Guests would lean forward on sofas to flatter Tulip, and their companions would turn aside and tap me on the arm. Now isn't your friend clever? And so enthralled to Tulip that everything she did was fine by me. I'd feel as proud of her as if she could so. One of my jobs was taking Julius to nursery on my way to school. Down the drive, over the bridge, walking on the side with the pavement, and up the path to the porch where all the others were struggling to get out of their brightly coloured wellies and raincoats. For a goodbye, Julius would lift his face and purse his lips to give me a giant smacker. Kissy pots! He turned from a sleepless monster into an easy and affectionate child. Devil to angel, said my parents. And even I enjoyed his constant stream of bright prattle as we strolled along together, hand in hand. I'd been forbidden to make arrangements to meet Tulip on school mornings, because I'd been late so often on days when she didn't show. But as often as not, out she'd jump from behind someone's front wall or one of the pillars of the bridge, startling me every time. She'd fall in step. Want to play stinking mackerel? All the way? Even the people at the bus stop? All the way. Every one. Even Mrs Boldell. So everyone who passed got enough of the game to unnerve them. We weren't rude, exactly. It was all done with a wrinkle of the nose, a tiny sniff, maybe even a fleeting look of disgust. Some days, with everyone bent double against the wind, it didn't work. On others, we must have left a trail of worried people. Often we'd turn and catch them plucking at their clothes, trying to look as if they were simply pulling a jacket straight or tightening a belt, when we knew... They were anxiously checking for odours. 
Mrs. Bodell, though, rumbled us thoroughly. She took no cheek, and some of her threats were awesome. I'm catching the bus into Erlingham now, but as soon as I get back, I shall speak to your head teacher. Don't think I don't know your parents, Natalie Barnes, and how ashamed they'll be to hear of your behaviour. I'd moan at Tulip. You're ruder than I am. How come it's always my name she broadcasts to the world? But I knew the answer anyway. Mum wasn't the first to point out that Games with Tulip had a habit of starting well for two and ending badly for one. I was the usual victim. But once or twice she tried her luck with Julius. I called a halt to putting on the bag, but then she started something called Babe in the Wood. One after another, while we were walking him, we'd vanish into the trees. Soon he'd be fretting. Then I'd materialise as calmly as if I'd never been gone. He'd spin round, and there was Tulip, back without a word. Somehow she'd distract him, and I'd be gone again. He'd turn, upset and confused, to find that Tulip had disappeared as well. The game used to drive him wild with fear and rage. And why are my memories of it so strong unless we played it for weeks? Maybe we only stopped because Mum calls us at it. She heard the screams, and running up, found Julius with tears spurting from his eyes, spitting a blaze of gibberish. Out here, right now, both of you! I stepped out at once, but this time, Julep had vanished for good and proper. That didn't bother Mum. She raised her voice, and warned her anyway. You listen to me, Tulip Pierce. If I ever catch you tormenting Julius again, you'll be in trouble. And as for you, Natalie... As for me, I was sent upstairs earlier than Julius for a whole week. Whichever of them it was, Mum or Dad, deliberately called out, Bedtime now, Natalie, in front of the guests, who looked up in astonishment from their first gins and tonics. You could almost hear them whispering to one another. Bedtime? Surely the child must be ten years old at least. From that day on, I wouldn't join in games with Julius, unless he quite enjoyed them. But Tulip didn't mind, because what with Christmas coming up, she was happy to be on her very best behaviour. Tulip loved Christmas at the palace. At her house we knew the decorations amounted to little more than a set of chipped nativity figures and some wobbly-headed Santa she never properly described. The wrappings for her presents were ironed over from last year and the only special foods were the turkey and Christmas pudding. Still, Tulip's pleading made my parents uneasy at first. Can I come early for breakfast? But Tulip, won't your parents mind? Won't they want you at home with them? Tulip put on her false face. Oh no, they don't mind. They say it's just a shame I don't have any brothers or sisters to share the day. And if I want to be with Natalie, they're happy for me. It didn't sound all that likely, but Mum allowed herself to be convinced. In that case, I'm sure we'd be delighted to have you. I look back now and wonder what price Tulip paid for Christmas at the palace. More than the other guests, I'll bet. I knew that, even back then. For once, as we were strolling home together after school, I heard a vicious bellow and looked up to see Mr Pierce leaning out of his truck window. Better get home before me, Tulip, or I'll snatch you bald-headed! I stood, rigid. Snatch her bald-headed? But Tulip had already fled. 
I followed her as far as the corner, picking up things that spilled out of her school bag and thinking about the odd things I'd heard her saying in our games. I'll peel you alive like a banana. Smile at me wrong today and I'll crush you. I'll make your eyes look like slits in a grapefruit. I'd always put them down to Tulip being clever, good with words. But was I wrong? Was it Tulip I'd been hearing? Or her terrifying father? No Christmas on earth would have been worth it for me. But I'd been spoiled. As long as I could remember, every December had blazed scarlet and gold. Bright coloured lanterns winked along the terraces. There were at least five decorated trees. Everything glittered and sparkled, and the food was amazing. Can we have pies with battlements? Natalie, when did we ever not have pies with battlements at Christmas? And will there be some of those great long pink fishes on a dish? Salmon tulip. Yes, there'll be salmon. And wine jellies like last year? Yes, wine jellies. And can I turn on the blinking lights? Dad grinned. Yes, Tulip. You can turn on the blinking lights. We all indulged her at Christmas. It was, my father said wryly, the only time Tulip ever acted her age. Her eyes kept widening. Her mouth kept falling open. And once, like Julius, she was even found scrabbling under the tree, shaking all the empty wrapped boxes, just to be sure that what she'd been told was true, and they were really only there for show. Each year, Mum found some way to smarten her up a bit. Here, Tulip, this dress belongs to Mrs Stoddart Cecily, but she's wearing her green one, and we think this will fit you. It's just for today, mind. You mustn't run off with it. There was a sticky moment, but Dad managed to save it. And Mrs Stoddart mustn't run off with you. So Tulip pretended that she hadn't heard or didn't mind, and let herself slip into enchantment. She cuddled the frock till Mum pushed her into the office. There Tulip raised her arms, and Mum lifted off her thin mock crochet top and unhooked her cheap skirt. The deep blue velvet of the frock tumbled all over her, falling in folds that turned her spindly thinness into height and hid her battered shoes. And can I wear it all day? All day. And all day we caught her stroking invisible puckers and creases out of the velvet and seeking out mirrors. Time and again she'd think of clever ways of getting rid of me for a few minutes, and when I rushed back she'd be smiling at herself in the glass as she watched the reflection of her solitary make-believe dance swirls and curtsies. Dad kept creeping up on her from the sides. Unbutton your beak, Tulip. Her eyes closed. A blissful look stole over her face as she opened her mouth as wide as a young thrush. He popped in the canapé or volavant or whatever. She learned the hard way about spoiling her appetite for lunch. And when, after dinner, it was clear she'd given no thought at all to getting home, Dad pulled her aside for a moment. Tulip. Aren't you going to get into hot water if you're late? On went the false face. They know I'm probably going to stay the night. They said I could. His troubled eyes met hers. He looked down first. All right, then. If you're sure. And he took Tulip by one hand and me by the other, and with Julius leading the way on his brand new tricycle, indoors for one day only, all guests warned, he marched us towards the piano. I expect we were dreadful at singing. But they would have drowned us out, that strange and hearty assortment of people who choose to spend Christmas in a big hotel. Some patted our shoulders and pointed to the place on the carol sheet. And others, who had no idea how much we'd already eaten, slipped unwrapped sweets into our hands. I remember the blue-rinsed ladies had gold teeth that winked in the candlelight and the men often stank of tobacco. Mr. Hearn's hands swept effortlessly up and down the keys, and if you looked sideways at Tulip in her beautiful blue dress, chirruping out Good King Wenceslas and Silent Night, her face radiant, you would never have thought that she'd have to go home and face a very different 
more ugly sort of music in the morning. Not that she couldn't hand it out herself. Dad said it first. I reckon some mean thoughts go on behind those pretty smiles of hers. And he was right. On our first day back at school after the holidays, Tulip was waiting for me at the gate. You've got it, haven't you? You didn't forget! I handed it over. Her eyes sparkled and she went dancing off in search of Jamie Whitten. She thrust the little box into his hand. What's this? What's it look like? It's a Christmas present. He shook it suspiciously. It's a bit late for that. If she'd said anything, he would have been even more wary. But she just shrugged. She had a gift for making people believe her. He glanced round. Miss Henson was standing on the steps. The bell would go any minute. Why did you get me a present? I just did. I didn't get you one. That's all right. She managed to look both shy and careless at the same time. I knew then that it was going to work. Tulip, shh, she said to me sharply. And then to Jamie, go on then, open it, it won't bite you. I could have said, no, don't, it's not a real present, just something stupid we did yesterday. Then Jamie would have stuffed it back at her and she'd have dropped it. And then, of course, she would have walked away. From him, from me. So I stood and watched as he tugged gingerly at the knotted silver thread and unwrapped the glistening paper. He tipped the lid back. The little black curls of dried dog mess sat in their crumpled tissue nest. Happy Christmas! crowed Tulip. Happy Christmas! I echoed. Bravely, he tried to defend himself. It isn't Christmas anymore, and so the joke's on you. And probably just about anyone else in the class could have carried it off. But not Jamie. Tulip knew how to choose her victims. From the moment she'd spotted the little desiccated pile beside the radiator and sent me off in search of a flat-bladed knife, she'd had Jamie Whitten in mind. And she was right. He kept his end up gamely all day long. I never even touched it. I guessed what was in it anyway. You two are just stupid. But after the last bell rang, Tulip hurried me across the playground and behind the wall. Keep your head down. Why? Just wait, she said fiercely. Obediently, I waited. Cars pulled up outside the school. Doors slammed. Cars drove away. Now, she said. Take a look. She timed it perfectly. Just as we raised our heads, Jamie's mother slid the car into gear and pulled out from the curb. And though, when he spotted us watching, he turned his head away as fast as possible, I still had time to see, through the freshly washed windscreen, the first few fat tears of misery roll down his cheek. And when I turned to look at her, Tulip's smile... And there's another time I shan't forget, when I stumbled and cut my knee, wading over to the stone boy in the lily pond. Blood poured from the gash. I looked down and felt quite frightened. With each step I took against the water, blood washed away, then welled up again. Hurry! yelled Tulip. Walk faster! Run! No one can run through water. By the time I got back to the edge, my heart was thumping. Good heavens, child! One of the guests had strolled over to see what was happening. Scattering peacocks, she hurried me up the terrace and propped me against a ledge. First came a linen cloth from one of the bars. I soaked that scarlet in seconds. Then came the towels, and then my parents arrived. Tulip danced round, getting in everyone's way, as Dad went to fetch a car as close as he could without flattening the flower beds, and everyone else spilled out advice. You realise she'll need at least half a dozen stitches. I shouldn't bother with the surgery. I'd take her straight to casualty at the hospital. Don't worry, Mrs Barnes. These things so often look a whole lot worse than they are. Dad appeared round the corner, and I was handed down over the terrace. Mum ran to keep up as Dad strode with his arms towards the back seat. He tipped me in, and Mum threw herself in beside me. Someone opened the door again to push in more towels. Oh, thank you, said Mum. Thank you. I heard a sharp tap and looked through the other window. 
Tulip was just outside, prancing about like a monkey. She made a stupid face, splaying her hands, tipping her head sideways and sticking out her tongue. Turning away, I caught the look my mother gave her in return. I shut my eyes then. I can shut them now, but I can still see both their faces. Tulips, well, ugly and uncaring, certainly. But mums, far, far more disturbing somehow. I can't really explain. All I can tell you is that mum was looking at Tulip the way no one normally looks at a child. <laughs> Tulip was always doing stupid things. Soon she was spending as much time sitting outside Miss Go Lightly's office as she spent back in class. And one day, chatting to Dad while he was doing the monthly cellar check, I very carelessly let this slip. Dad casually changed the subject. But two days later, Will Stannard came back into class from the dentist to report that my dad's car was parked right outside the school. Next morning, Mr Barraclough walked in and said, I think we'll sit you next to Barney, Natalie. Tulip was outraged. Why does she have to move? Mr Barraclough bit back a sharp response and said instead, We all just think that everyone might benefit from a little change. Furious, Tulip swept everything off her desk onto the floor. If Natalie can't sit by me, then I'm not doing any more work. If any of the rest of us had done that, we would have been in such deep trouble. But it was as if the staff were half scared, half despairing of Tulip. So Mr Barraclough let her be. She sat, stone-faced, arms folded, through the lesson, and he ignored her. When the bell rang, he sent her to the office as usual, and I spent yet another lonely break. Tulip's sheer recklessness made all the other children nervous and if there was even the slightest possibility that she might be sent back out in time to join us, they'd stay clear. In class time, the teachers tried over and over to give me opportunities to make new friends. Natalie, why don't you pair up with Susan to put up the new corridor display? Marcy and Natalie, I'll leave you here to set out all the chairs. I'd chat to them, and they'd chat back. I'd even wonder what it would be like to have them as friends. But when we came back into the classroom, I couldn't help but glance across. And there was Tulip, seeking me out with her hard, hungry little eyes, as if she could actually see if I'd stayed faithful, if I still belonged to her. Back then, of course, I never thought to wonder what it was Tulip saw in me. But now I think, could some small part of it have been that, if she could keep someone as faceless and nondescript as me as her friend then it really couldn't prove so much that everyone else hated her. And hate her they did, because she spoiled everything. I'm afraid we can't start until Tulip's quite ready. If there's any more messing about, then we won't have the ropes out. Tulip! I'm sorry if it's a disappointment to most of you, but after a certain person's behaviour on the last field trip... The staff lost patience with her. Why do you make things so difficult for yourself? She'd scowl, but not answer, making that old game of ours, days of dumbness, into a regular thing. I'm still waiting. Still no response. People from other classes would walk past in the corridor and eye her curiously. You do realise, don't you, Tulip, that this is just one more silly way of trying to grab everyone's attention. But there are a lot of people in this school, not just you. Another few minutes of silence, and then whichever teacher it was would usually crack. Well, you'd better go out for break now, and when you come in again I expect you to be more sensible. Off you go. Out in the playground, she'd run wild, swearing and shrieking and cheeking the dinner ladies while I stood by, passively watching. 
One day, a message came, bellowed out from the steps. Natalie, Miss Golightly wants you in her room, right now. The world drained of colour. I was terrified. I stumbled on the steps and got lost round corners I knew as well as my own face. With the secretary watching, I tapped on the panels of Miss Golightly's door. Is that Natalie Barnes? Already Miss Golightly was striding towards me. Thrusting the door wide, she caught me by the neck of my jersey and hauled me across to the window. Is that your friend? she cried, pointing. Is it? Is it? Tulip was running up to gangs of little ones and stamping at their games. Look at her, spoiling things for everybody, rampaging about. She made a visible effort to calm herself. Sit down, Natalie. It's time that you and I had a little talk. I don't remember much of it. Only how very frightened I was, suddenly to be put in a chair that had cushions, and talked to as if I were grown up. It seemed to break all the rules, and left me too rattled even to listen properly, let alone speak up with sensible answers. Only when Miss Golightly moved on from what she kept calling Tulip's real difficulties, and her influence on the people around her, did I stop feeling like a panicked rabbit. By then, she must have been hinting at my parents' concerns, because the first words I remember saying were, They can't mind Tulip that much, because they let her come. She looked astonished. What? To the palace? Really? Yes, I said resolutely. She comes a lot. Dad's very nice to her. This irritated Miss Golightly, you could tell. Clearly Dad must have given her a very different picture. Frowning, she said, Perhaps they prefer to keep an eye on the two of you together. Have you thought of that? Dutifully, I tried to look as if she might be right. But I knew better. I'd worked out long ago that Mum let Tulip keep coming, because she couldn't stand watching me mope round the palace without her. It just got on her nerves to see me floating aimlessly through room after room. And Dad had a soft spot for Tulip. He knew her faults. And he may even have thought she was as bad for me outside school as she was in. But I'd seen the look on his face the day we drove round a corner to find Mr. Pierce thrashing his dog in the shadow of a hedgerow. And I saw the extra gentleness and courtesy with which he always greeted Tulip's mother when she tried creeping past us in the street. Dad didn't say much, but I knew exactly what he thought of Tulip's home life. And tell her she couldn't come? Well, he just couldn't do it. Perhaps Miss Golightly thought he'd not been straight with her with his complaints. In any case, my ticking off was over. She rose to her feet. Natalie, I hope you'll think seriously about all the things I've been saying. This time, the hand on my shoulder was almost gentle as she walked me to the door. Because, I warn you, you'll come to no good at all as Tulip's hold your coat merchant. Think about that. Tulip was lying in wait in the playground. What did she want? My heart was back to thumping. Nothing much, honestly. Tulip was irritated. Well then, bird brain, what did she say? Perhaps I was peeved with her for getting me into such trouble. Anyhow, just for once... I managed to speak up for myself. I don't think that bird brains are bright enough to remember what's been said to them. Furious, she lashed out at the nearest thing, which was a folding sign about the next parents' evening. One of the dinner ladies bore down on her threateningly, and I vanished round the corner. I wandered nervously round the edges of the infants' playing area. But by the time Tulip ambled back in sight, accompanied by Marcy... She was all smiles. I wondered if she'd forgotten I'd been somewhere of interest, though I had more sense than to resurrect the subject. But that night, when Mum sent me along to give George the barman a message, I sidled up to one of the guests I knew best on my way out and asked him, Mr Scott Henderson, what's a hold-your-coat merchant? Winking at George, he said to me, now, don't tell me that you and your little friend are getting into fights. I felt myself go scarlet. 
Fights? That's what it means, he explained. A hold-your-coat merchant is a person who likes to watch someone else get into trouble. He made his voice sound like a little boy's. Go on, he squeaked. You fight him. He deserves it. I'll stand here safely and I'll hold your coat. He took a sip of whiskey. Why are you asking, anyway? I'm not allowed to linger in the bars, and just as I began to scour my brain for some likely story, George raised his eyebrows at me over the beer glass he was polishing. I danced away. No reason, I caroled behind me. It just came up at school. Next morning, I learned the reasons for Tulip's smiles. I kept my eyes peeled for her all the way from the nursery. But when I reached the school gates, she was already in the playground, locked arm in arm with Marcy. She greeted me coolly. Marcy's with us today. That's all right, isn't it? I nodded. Marcy's quarrels with Claire, though frequent and explosive, were famously short-lived. I thought that I'd have Tulip back by break. But Marcy stayed with us all day. I was upset. Tulip kept calling me bird brain. But still I tagged along, pretending I hardly noticed and didn't care, till we drifted past Harry's supermarket after school. Coming in? You could tell from her eyes it was a challenge. No, I said. Not today. Why not? He watches us. I can feel it. He doesn't like us in there. That's his problem. But it makes me not want to go in there. Baby but Marcy was tugging on her arm. So she gave up, and we went round the back. We started balancing along the low walls, dividing the sections of the car park. Right in the middle of a wobbly arabesque, Tulip suddenly announced to Marcy that the manager of Harry's had that very morning offered her a Saturday job. Don't be silly, said Marcy. Nobody gives that sort of work to somebody our age. It's supposed to be unofficial. He said I remind him of his little sister who choked to death on pencil sharpenings. On pencil sharpenings. The tulip touch. I was so mad at her for the sheer stupidness of it and for ignoring me so horribly that when she took a gold chain I'd never seen before out of her pocket and twirled it round her fingers, I left it to Marcy to ask all the questions. Where did you get that? It's mine. Is it gold, though? Real gold? Of course it is. Can I see it? You're looking at it. No, I mean, can I hold it? Pleased with her interest, Tulip spilled the chain into Marcy's hand. Marcy turned to the sunlight and studied it. This is real gold. It's got that funny mark. She raised her eyes to Tulip's. It can't be yours. Yes, it is. I don't think so. It must be worth an awful lot. The edgy tone I knew so well came into Tulip's voice. Why shouldn't it be mine? Marcy said nothing, and with Tulip standing there in her cheap clothes and worn jacket, there was no need. Furious, Tulip snatched back the necklace and hurled it, glinting and rippling as far as she could. It flew across the car park like a live snake and fell with a rattle into the huge rubbish drum beside the wall. We stared. Then Tulip said to Marcy, I don't want it any more. You can have it if you find it. Marcy hesitated just a shade too long. And then, humiliated by the notion of scrabbling in a dustbin for something cast out by Tulip, she turned her back on us. I don't want it. She strode away without another word. Part of me so longed to follow. I knew that I could catch her by the arm and say to her, I reckon Tulip must have stolen that. And in the sheer excitement of the moment, we could have become friends. I even thought that when she made up again with Claire, she very probably would let me stay. I was still staring after her forlornly when Tulip said, I'm going home now. I walked with her as far as the bridge. We still weren't friendly. In fact, we hardly spoke. 
All I remember is that at one point she was struggling to find something at the bottom of her school bag and things kept dropping, so she turned to me. Here, she said. Be some help, will you? Hold my coat. Part 2 It was Julius who started it. We were sitting on the wall of the veranda one morning when he said suddenly, Did you know Tulip was a witch? Don't be silly. She is, he said stubbornly. She always knows exactly what I'm thinking. No one knows what you're thinking. Tulip does. She knew which cake I wanted yesterday. When Mum sent the plate round, Tulip was reading my mind to see which one I was after. Then she took it. I expect you were staring at it. No, he said gravely. I used to be that silly, but I stopped doing that ages ago and made it so I only thought. He shifted uncomfortably on the ledge. Then she got good at that as well. Good at what? Knowing what I was thinking. Julius! And then, he finished in a rush, I learned to make myself think something different. If I want the only coconut cake on the plate, I think I want the chocolate one, as hard as I can. And for a while it fooled her, but not any more. She can get through that too now. She can read what I really think. And there was no shaking him. Tulip was a witch. And that's what must have set me off. From that day on, I lost my confidence that all the thoughts I had were quite my own. At first, it started as a little game. Not one of the ones we did together. A private one I never shared with her. I'd make believe that... If she wanted, she could read my mind and even send her own thoughts directly into my head to swirl about and make the whole place hers. I'd try and lay myself open to it and be a blank slate in case it really could happen. And that felt so weird and puppet-like that I came to enjoy it. Soon, even when we were busy playing with other things, I'd secretly be playing the tulip touch, practically inviting her in. Want to play all the grey people? She'd ask me. Whatever you want. I'll be the leader, shall I? Yes, you be leader. Right. First, we'll go through the coffee lounge, and then the writing room, and then the conservatory. All right. You'd think I didn't have a will of my own. And wouldn't you suspect that she'd get bored playing with such a servile shadow? But not a bit of it. It suited her fine. We'd march in silence through the chosen rooms, gazing with utter contempt at all those amazingly dull-looking people who spent an age tinkling their coffee cups, or staring into space over their drinks, or fiddling inside their handbags. Did they have any thoughts at all? Could they be thinking interesting things? Or were they just as they seemed? People with brains as grey and lifeless as their faces. Dad spotted us on our third circuit. OK, you two, hop along. These rooms are supposed to be restful. And off we went to play along the flaggy shore in the upstairs passage or fat and loud outside the bar. Whatever Tulip felt like doing next. She must have noticed I was different, but she never said a word. Even back then, that bothered me. What did she think was happening? And once, I remember turning back when she had sent me off across the hall to snaffle a few sheets of headed paper from the desk. And she had such a horrid smile on her face. Smug, she looked. Cocky. I fetched the paper, but when I came back, my self-imposed reflex of submission failed. 
I don't see why I had to get it. Oh, don't you? The tone was disdainful, and the look said, clear as paint, I know why you chose me. But surely, surely even someone as stupid as you has worked out by now why it was someone like me chose you. Explain to me how you can come so close to rescue, only to have it snatched away. Just take the time when we were moving up from the village school. I didn't realise anything was brewing, till Dad made a point of seeking me and Tulip out. Where are you moving on to after the holidays, Tulip? Will it be Talbot Harry's in town? She made a face. I suppose so. You'll still be with Natalie then, Dad told her cheerfully, and then... Excuse me, girls, as he strolled back across the lawn. I couldn't look at Tulip. Suddenly, like someone drowning, I wanted so much to lift an arm to try and save myself. And Tulip could always read my face. If I knew Dad was lying, she'd know it too. If he's planning on separating us, Tulip said thoughtfully, he'll have to put more effort into it than that. That night... I overheard the plan. I think we should send Natalie to Heathcote. I know it's a lot further, but several children from the village go there. Mum tried to sound me out. How would you feel about it, Natalie? It's a long bus ride. I shrugged. You'd see a lot less of... She hesitated. Some of your old friends. I shrugged again. I knew if I was sent to Heathcote... That would be curtains for mornings and evenings with Tulip. I'd set off too early and get back too late. It wasn't clear why it should make a difference to weekends. But surely in a new school with new teachers, new classmates, new people on the bus, I would be able to make new friends. The registration forms sat in the in-tray on the reception desk. I fingered them over and over when no one was watching. Heathcote Grange Secondary School Last date for applications, Thursday, 18th August. I could have filled it in myself. It was so easy. Name, home address, addresses, date of birth, previous schools, names and ages of siblings, health problems, if any. The days before the deadline, I was a bird on a hot wire. Each time Dad came through a doorway or cleared his throat, I was expecting him to say... Well, it's decided, Natalie. Heathcote it is. On Monday, the wrong meat orders were delivered, and two of the waiters fell out and stormed off work. On Tuesday, Julius got a lump of grit in his eye and rubbed it so hard he had to be taken down to the surgery. Wednesday was kitchen inspection. Everything stops for that. And on Thursday, when I fingered through the papers in the tray, I saw the form was still quite blank. Tulip turned up next morning for the first time in a week. Dad met her on the stairs and suddenly looked troubled. She gave him her usual cheeky grin. Morning, Mr Barnes. Hello, Tulip. Lightly, she bounced her fingers on the banisters and carried on up. He hurried down. I watched him make for the reception desk and riffle through the in-tray. Mum came out of the office. What's that you're looking for? He held it up. Oh, dear, she said. Oh, what a nuisance. What's the date on it? The 18th. Yesterday. No point in driving it in and begging them to take her anyway. He looked at his watch. The Newsoms will be here in ten minutes to sort out the details of their wedding lunch. I could do that with them. I thought you were taking Julius for his check-up. Oh, right. There was a worried pause. I watched from overhead. Tulip was watching me. And suddenly I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that she had stayed away all week deliberately to lower their guard. Mum shook off her unease. It's not too late, I'm sure. Shall we think about it as soon as we've got a free moment? Dad noticed Tulip lingering on the stairs. Yes, later, he said, and hurried off. And that was the last I heard. The form lay in the tray another week, and then it vanished. The last days disappeared as well. 
We found a skylight with a smashed alarm and played Watch the Skies behind the parapets. And on the first day of September, I turned up at the bus stop. New journey, new uniform, new school, new set of teachers. And good old tulip, as usual. I hated Talbot Harris. So did she. Hated the slime green rooms, the shoving corridors, the ringing cloakrooms and the screaming bells. Hated the work and hated the sarcastic teachers. Hated the food. And hated being on my own. Someone had shopped us. We never found out if it was Dad or the teachers from our old school. But we were separated for almost every lesson. Even our registration class was not the same. I'd catch a glimpse of Tulip as she was buffeted my way down some seething staircase and call out hopefully, See you at break on the back steps! But she was hardly ever there, and each school hour went on forever, till I was a bag of nerves who jumped at every raised voice in a corridor and bit my fingernails until they bled and couldn't concentrate on what the teachers said for the hot tears prickling behind my eyes. This is your fault, I shouted at Julius when he caught me weeping over homework I couldn't do. If it weren't for you and your stupid sore eye, I'd be at Heathcote now. But it wasn't Julius's fault that he was the apple of Mum's eye, and everything to do with him came first and second and next and last. Julius's tumbling class, Julius's visit to the clinic, new trousers for Julius. He didn't set it off, and never smirked or crowed. Sometimes he even looked rueful, as if I'd been the luckier of the two, with no one noticing if I was there or not, or if I was happy, or if things were going right or wrong. Sorry, I sniffled, and he patted my hand. I know, he said. I'll go and tell him you're crying. It was a generous offer. It's never easy in a big hotel to get attention, if you're not paying for it. But if it was Julius who went, Mum would look up at once. I shook my head. No, honestly, I'll be all right. And no doubt I soon was. It's hard for anyone to start at a new school. Tiring and nerve-wracking. No wonder I was always so glad to see Tulip waiting on the steps at ten to four. I'd rush up, full of questions. Where were you? I went past your gym class twice and didn't see you. Were you hiding in the cloakroom? She'd give her little sideways grin. Tell you later. Let's just get out of here. She'd take my arm and off we'd go past all the people who'd come on with us from our old school. Susan and Janet with their brand new friends and Will and Jamie who'd been accepted at once in the lads' gang. We'd saunter down the street towards our stop. I'd hear a rumble gathering behind us. Here's a bus coming now. She'd cock her head to one side. What's it to be then? Home or havoc? And so relieved to be out of there, out at last, and no longer alone, I'd choose the one I knew she wanted to hear. Havoc, I'd cry. Havoc! And as the bus roared past, with the breeze of it whipping up our skirts, we'd slip away down the alley, out of sight. You couldn't really call it havoc. It was just stupid things like cheeking people as we ran past and telling old ladies their shortcut was closed at the other end because the police had found a body with its throat cut, and hiding behind walls to flick mud pellets at women wearing smart jackets. Sometimes we were spiteful. Tulip would surreptitiously jam one of her specially selected twigs 
short but tough and sinewy, between the spokes of some young mother's pushchair, then watch with glee as the frustrated mother pushed and tugged and struggled with a break. Once we watched one of them burst into tears, and I felt bad. But mostly I took Tulip's line on it. It was just fun, a good laugh, something to do. I only stopped her twice. Once when she started with a milk bottle smashing, and another time when she took someone's rabbit out of its hutch. We'd had fun with animals before, dead ones. It's not till you go looking that you have any idea how many dead birds and furry things are lying round the average town. Sometimes I think I'll never be able to see another roadkill without thinking of Tulip. She'd flick them over with her shoe. Looks all right to me," she'd say critically. "Yes, that'll do." She'd scoop it up in one of the torn plastic bags with which Erlingham is littered, and we'd carry it round with us. It could have been a loaf and a pound of tomatoes until we saw the perfect place. There's a hatch. We'd be up to the fence in a moment. Is it empty? Doesn't matter. It wouldn't have either. I'd watched her push fat, spoiled rabbits off their favourite patch of straw to shove a dead pigeon or blackbird in their place, but I meant the house. I said, "Oh, that." She glanced dismissively at the kitchen window with its prissy curtains hanging in scallops. There's no one looking anyway. Who's going then? I'll go. I gave her a leg up. There was no stopping Tulip once she'd started, so it was better to get the whole business done. She landed lightly on the other side. I passed the mucky bag over, and she set off boldly, sauntering across the lawn as if she owned it. I watched her prise open the hutch lid. Well, hello, Thumper. She lifted the rabbit out by the ears. I hated that. I knew people said it didn't hurt them, but I didn't believe it. And there was something in the way she did it, slowly, deliberately, almost with relish, that set my nerves on edge and started me scrambling along the fence, looking for a foothold of my own. By the time I got over, she had her hands over its eyes. Gone dark, has it, Bunny? You had to be careful. She could turn just like that. So, can I hold him, Tulip, just for a little bit? She shook her head. First come, first served. Please, I said, give him to me. She grinned unpleasantly. You don't know he's a he. He might be a she. It doesn't matter. You could just let me have a go at cuddling him. Only if you've guessed right. She upturned the squirming rabbit for no more than a couple of seconds. She's a she, so she's mine. She's not yours, Tulip. She is now. Tulip was crooning in the rabbit's ear. Who's a clever bunny? Who's going to be a good girl? Who's Tulip's special one? She's not going to make fuss, is she? Oh no, she isn't going to do that because she enjoys it, really, doesn't she? And if she starts struggling, she'll get hurt. She finished up so savagely that I knew I was watching something horrible. Nothing to do with the rabbit she was holding, but darker, much darker, and hidden, and coming from deep inside Tulip. I heard my own voice saying, "Put it down." It was like breaking a spell. The strange look cleared from her face. She practically threw the rabbit back on its straw and turned away. I slammed the hutch lid closed. "Quick," I said. "Someone's watching. Hurry up." She wasn't fooled. To prove it, she very deliberately took her time, snapping heads off the flowers as she strolled back towards the fence. I didn't care. I just scrambled over as fast as I could, and then, fueled with relief at landing on the other side, gave myself over to her yet again. What shall we do now, Tulip? You decide. That was the year we started the little visits. I've no idea what set us off. 
All I remember is that one minute we were rollicking merrily, arm in arm, past some perfect stranger's front gate, and the next we were on the doorstep, and Tulip had her finger pressed firmly on the ringing bell. Yes? Can I help you? I'm no good at ages. She was older than Mum and younger than most people's grannies. We were wondering if you could tell us the way to the castle. Castle? The woman looked baffled. There's no castle round here. Earl Castle, persisted Tulip. It sounded so silly, I nearly let out a snigger. No, not round here. But neither of us moved, and in the end she let us in the hall. While she leafed through a stack of pamphlets from a drawer, we rolled our eyes and made sneering faces at one another about the pictures on her walls. I'm sorry, she said at last, looking up. I can find nothing here. But Tulip didn't move, so neither did I. You'll have to go now, I'm afraid, the woman said after a moment. I watched Tulip meet her gaze and willed her not to push her luck and get us into trouble. But then Tulip put on her false smile. Thank you for looking anyway. Hastily, I slapped on my dad's be pleasant to the guests face. Yes, thank you for looking. She was still staring when we turned at the gate. Goodbye, Tulip called out sweetly. Thank you again. The woman didn't move. I wondered if somehow, by accident, Tulip had picked a particularly suspicious person, or if, at the next house she chose, there'd be somebody even more wary and watchful. Your turn, said Tulip. She made me run up and down the street till my face was sticky and burning. Then I knocked on the door. Excuse me for bothering you, but could I please come in and have a glass of water? The elderly gentleman ran his eyes over my school uniform, as if to assure himself it wasn't fake. You needn't come in. I'll fetch some water. Just stay there. There was an edge to his voice, and he glanced round twice as he hurried to the kitchen. I knew if I so much as stepped over the wooden strip dividing indoors from out, he'd shoot back whether or not the glass was filled and order me away. The tumbler he handed me was clouded and knobbly. There you are. He stood and waited. I took a couple of sips. Tulip had assured me that if only I could get the person chatting, I'd be inside in a flash. So I said, we have some glasses just like this at home. Do you? he said coldly. We don't, of course. The glasses at the palace are crystal clear, always shining, always sparkling. Please hurry and drink it. I have things to do. I saw Tulip watching me from over the hedge. It's hard to drink fast, I said hastily. The problem's with my throat, with swallowing. Last time I was in hospital... They thought they'd got rid of it. It's very unusual, you see, in someone my age. So everyone was very disappointed when it came back. And I was in, of course. I only stayed a few minutes, till I felt a little less dizzy. But I'd got in. Gradually, over the months, Tulip set harder and harder tasks. Please may I use your telephone? Do you have a biscuit for my friend? Would you lend me a pencil and some paper? It was astonishing sometimes just how easy it was. Some people didn't even count, said Tulip. They were obviously so lonely that if we'd been wearing masks and carrying knives, they'd still probably have ushered us into their kitchens. Others were bewildered or suspicious, which made it that bit harder to tack on the extras Tulip insisted on, like swivelling a framed photo round to face the wall or 
sliding their scissors off the table to stab them points down in the soil of a plant pot. We never stayed too long, though, just in case. And even so, I sometimes got home late. Usually, no one noticed. It's not as if I walk through the main door and ask for my key at reception. But sometimes, slipping silently up the back stairs, I'd bump into Mum and see her glance curiously at her watch. Miss the bus, darling? Oh, it was silly, I'd say. Marcy and I got chatting, and then Mr Phillips wanted something carrying round to the laboratories, and... My voice trailed off, even before the next set of doors could swallow it entirely. She never called me back to hear the end. I doubt if she was listening anyway. Always in a hotel, there are dozens of things to get done. She was forever busy. And often, I was glad of that. After Tulip invented wild nights, it might be hours before my heart stopped thudding, and I stopped being certain each time the phone rang that it was the fire service or the police. I don't know why wild nights came as such a surprise. Tulip had always had a passion for fire. Candles, matches, sparklers, bonfires. She loved them all. I can't count the number of times Dad caught her behind the dustbins, setting fire to paper just to watch it blaze, then flush with orange sprinkles as it crumpled to black at her feet. Give her some fancy wrapping paper, and she'd sit for hours tearing it into strips and dropping them one by one into the fire in the back lounge. Look! Look at this greeny-blue! These colours are magic! We helped with every bonfire. Well, I helped. She simply poked holes through the sodden leaves and watched the red caves deep inside them burn. Come on, Tulip. I fetched three whole bags while you've been standing there. Shh! Don't bother me. The gardener used to nudge me. Don't go too close, he'd say. Can't you see Tulip's worshipping her fire guard? It was a joke. But honestly, you might have thought she was in church the way she'd stayed so still. Not like on wild nights. When we played that, some sort of unholy excitement ran through her every gesture, her every word. She'd push and pull me to the place she had in mind, while I begged not to go. We'll get in trouble. So? And I was quiet. Because for me, the notion of getting in trouble was so serious that I had to hide from her exactly how much it mattered. And she wouldn't have understood anyhow. Things were so different at her house. Tulip said very little, but I'd picked up the fact that she was always being punished for stupid things like knocking a fork off the table or leaving a stiff tap dripping a tiny bit or not coming quickly enough when Mr Pierce called her. Her dad would suddenly let fly and keep at her till even her timid mother was forced to stop pretending she hadn't noticed what was going on. She'd step in to try and stop him. Then Mr Pierce would turn his savage mood on her. It makes no difference what I do, Tulip explained. He picks on me to start a fight with her. So there was no stopping her by wailing about trouble. She simply grabbed handfuls of my coat and pulled again. Come on, Natalie! It's all planned! Sometimes I trawl around for an excuse. No, not tonight. I promised Mum I'd help with next week's menus. Tipping her head to the side, she says sarcastically, Does the itsy bitsy baby want to go home to her mummy? I hated it when she jeered at me. All right, I said, but only something small. A sweetie swipe? No, he watches us every minute, Tulip. He knows. All right, then. Exploding greenhouse. No. She made her last offer. Dustbin fire. It's only rubbish, anyway. All right, a dustbin fire. But only one. Only one. Promise, Tulip. Cross my heart. Her eyes went wide with honest promising, just as in half an hour's time they'd widen again from all the spitting orange magic conjured from some perfect stranger's matching grey bins. Tulip, you promised! One, you said! I meant one more, stupid! She was so horrid to me. 
endlessly rude and disparaging. But somehow, it didn't hurt. I think I just treated her insults like bad weather, keeping my head down and pressing on with my self-appointed task of keeping her out of trouble. It was I who prized the package she was about to send to Mrs. Bodell out of her hand. You can't pose that. Why not? You're not allowed to put stuff like that in a letterbox. I hurled it as far as it would go into the road and watched with satisfaction as a car rolled over it. Good job I didn't bother with a stamp, she said, unruffled. In the same way, I confiscated her rude Christmas cards one by one as she finished them. Tulip, it's such a waste. You spend ages doing all this brilliant lettering, and I have to rip them into pieces and stuff them in the bin. Nobody makes you. And it was true. Nobody made me. But still, somehow, I'd come to believe that keeping Tulip out of the trouble she spent her whole life fomenting was time well spent. And maybe it was for me. It kept me close to her, and I needed Tulip. While I trailed round quietly, doing what I was told and being no trouble, Tulip lived my secret life. While teachers watched me sitting quietly at my desk, I was really outside on the hill with Tulip, openly watching the rest of us file in and out of classes. When I answered the palace guests' boring questions over and over again, always polite, always smiling, I was secretly swearing as foully as she did. And when Mum didn't notice me as she swept past, looking for Julius, I was in silent rages that would put Tulip to shame. I was as bad as she was, and the clever thing was, nobody even noticed. Even Dad was fooled. You're looking pale. Are you sure that you're sleeping properly? I'm all right. He turned me round to the light. But you've got shadows underneath your eyes. I've been doing a lot of homework. <laughs> tell me another, he scoffed. But you could tell that he believed me. And why not? It was a whole lot easier, and took less time than trying to find out the truth. Spring came, and Tulip's moods got worse and worse. She swung doors in my face, and kicked a huge dent in my cloakroom locker, and was so hateful that even I took to steering clear of her for days on end. Then I'd walk into the girls' lavatories to find her scratching foul words on the wall over the sinks, and just as if we'd never been apart, I'd be back to trying to stop her. Tulip, they've only just finished painting in here. What's the point of making it look horrible straight away? She gouged the plaster with her locker key. It's their own fault. They shouldn't have chosen such a stupid colour. Pink for nice little girlies. It's better than that old green. I like that green. You said you didn't. You were always going on about it. Plaster sprayed from the wall. Oh, shut up, Natalie. She'd never had any patience, but now it seemed everything got under her skin. She was angry with everyone, and it didn't make any difference whether or not they were cross with her first. Almost as soon as anyone spoke to her, on went that little mask of frozen rage. And when she wasn't angry, she was spiteful. That's rubbish what you're drawing, Natalie. I kept my eyes on my paper. Apart from games, art was the only lesson we had together now. At least I don't draw the same thing every week. And it was true. All Tulip ever drew were children with huge, forlorn eyes, copied from soppy greetings cards she'd lifted from the shop beyond the bus stop. She moved her hand across to hide some now, because Mrs Miniver was coming our way. Have you started yet, Tulip? I was just thinking first. Mrs Miniver inspected her watch. You've got exactly half an hour. By the time that bell rings, I want to see a proper self-portrait. None of your usual little self-pitying cherubs. Now get along with it. Without even asking, Tulip pulled my tray of paints nearer her easel than mine and started with a series of careless brush stabbings and pokings. Aren't you going to draw yourself first? 
I know what I look like, she snapped, and just became absorbed in her painting till Kirsten strolled over to borrow a rubber and complain. That stupid Jeremy she's put me with. Well, look what I've got, Tulip said contemptuously. I looked up. She was pointing at me. And did I rise up and hit her? Did I slap her face? Send her wobbly easel flying and pour the scummy brush water over her head? No. I just said feebly, Oh, do shut up, Tulip, and kept on with my work. But I did hate her then. I hated her so much that I could hardly wait for the half hour to disappear. I'd seen her fierce rubbings and scrubbings, her brutal daubs. Most people would take more care hurling rubbish into their dustbins. I'd seen her splayed brush come back again and again to the black and what was left of the purple and to the fiery red she'd turned to ditch water with her careless rinsing. Suddenly, I couldn't wait to see what Mrs Miniver made of Tulip's self-portrait. The bell rang. She appeared in front of us. Finished? Tulip shrugged, totally indifferent, and tore her sheet of paper from the easel. Mrs Miniver took it from her. But though her face darkened as she inspected the painting, something about it must have given her pause, because she pinned it back on the easel and stepped back to look at it from further away. And I stopped pretending that I wasn't watching and looked at it too. It was the strangest thing. The fury and contempt of Tulip's brushwork had turned to whirlpools of violence on the paper. Everything about it was dark and furious, and every inch of it seemed to suck you in and swirl you round, making you feel dizzy and anxious. And everywhere you looked, your eyes were drawn back over and over to the centre, where, out of the blackness, two huge forlorn eyes stared out as usual half begging, half accusing. I waited for the explosion. But Mrs Miniver just said, Look at it, Tulip. Know that you've finished. At least take a look. Putting her hands on Tulip's shoulders, she turned her to face the easel. Tulip's eyes went cold and hard. Mrs Miniver waited. But when it became obvious that Tulip wasn't going to say a word, she simply sighed. Well then, off you go, she said gently. Tulip reached out to rip the painting off the easel, but Mrs Miniver put out a hand. No, I'll keep this. Tulip stalked off. I stayed behind to pack her things along with mine and ask, Will she get into trouble? Still staring distractedly at the painting, Mrs Miniver repeated, Trouble? For making that huge mess, I insisted, and doing more big round sad eyes, even though you told her that was exactly what she mustn't do. I don't know what I expected, but certainly not a look of such contempt. I felt so frustrated and betrayed, I could practically feel myself screaming inside. Why does Tulip always get away with it? Why does nobody ever stop her? Why? 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 But the best I could manage to Mrs Miniver was a sullen. It was supposed to be a self-portrait. That's what you said. A self-portrait. Nothing else. I waited for her to tell me off but she just turned back to the painting. Oh, Natalie, she said, as gently as she'd spoken to Tulip. Look at it. Just look at it. And this time, it was there for me. My anger and frustration blew away like so much litter. I stood beside Mrs Miniver, staring at Tulip's self-portrait. And this time, all that I could think was what I finally managed to whisper. Oh, Mrs Miniver, I'm just so glad that I'm not her. So was it pity drew me back? Time and again, I'd almost gather up the strength to break away, and something would happen to stop me in my tracks. Like the day we heard the news about Muriel Brackenbury. Just think, we know somebody whose sister has drowned. Tulip, stop saying that. But we could sell our stories to the paper. 
We could be photographed with our arms round Janet. Don't be ridiculous. Janet doesn't even like us. Tulip's eyes shone. I bet she's so upset. She won't be able to stop thinking about it. I was disgusted with her. Why was she so nosy about other people's feelings? Did she have none of her own that she should be so obsessed about someone else's? And she didn't even feel sorry for Janet. That was obvious. She had the same look on her face as when we gave that horrible box to Jamie and when she made Marcy cry by lying to her that she'd failed her maths. She just liked to prod and invent and twist and poke to watch people go ugly with fright or burst into tears of misery. Now she was rolling Muriel's name round and round. Brackenbury, Brackenbury. It's odd, isn't it? Because I expect when she was found she was near Bracken and near Berries. If you don't stop talking about it, I'm catching the next bus home. She didn't even hear me. Drowned. Think of it. To get so close to the bank and still go under, swallowing all that water. I expect Janet will keep waking up imagining it now. I bet she will. After all, it's her sister. Don't, Tulip. It's horrible. Yes, isn't it? I stared at her. She thought I meant horrible to drown. Not horrible to say, and settling herself on the wall by the bus stop, she just went on and on. It must feel awful opening your mouth for air and more and more water rushing in instead. I expect you swallow so much that when they find you, you're all swollen up, not like with kittens. I bet a person must keep trying over and over to. But I'd stop listening. Everything round us, the street, the cars, the people, all bleached away to invisible. And I was back to eight years old, holding my father's hand on a baking afternoon, and seeing Tulip for the very first time, still as a stone in that cornfield. Not yet a friend of hers, not yet sucked in, and not in the slightest scared of her. You drowned that kitten, didn't you? She broke off her excited ramblings. Which kitten? The one you were holding on the day we met. I always thought it was your dad who got rid of them, but it was you. No, it wasn't. She said it quite firmly, though it wasn't true. But I was used to that, and suddenly I understood how Tulip could lie and lie and never see how ridiculous her untruth looked to other people. In her eyes, it was the world that was wrong. If the world had only been right, if things had only fallen out the way they should, then she would never have had to lie or steal or be spiteful. If the world had only been right, she'd be a nice and good person, the girl she was inside before it all went wrong, and she got spoiled all along with it. It was you, I persisted. So what if it was? Nothing. I kept my voice easy, even bright. I was just wondering. That's all. Wondering what? What it was like. She turned to look at me. I forced myself not to show even a flicker of feeling. I closed my mind to her. Slam, clang, shut us down. I wasn't going to play the tulip touch right now. It's none of your business. I know. I said, "It's just that I never realised, and you never said." She gave the flippant playground retort, "You never asked." I felt like screaming at her. Why should I ask, Tulip? Who ever would have even thought? But instead, I walked my fingers steadily along the wall, and tore off a strip of moss. Did it take long? I asked, casually pulling the shreds apart. Can you sense truth coming? Oh, I think you can. That's why I always had to do it myself," she said, firm, proud, self-righteous even. So it would take less time. They had to be done, you see, or we'd be. 
overrun. I knew it was her father's word from the way that she said it. Overrun. But Dad wouldn't take the time. He'd just shove them in a crock of water and slam the lid, and you could hear them scrabbling and pushing at the top. And it took forever. I bet it did. I could hear it as I sat listening. The mewings and scratchings. The lid lifting like potatoes on the boil. The driblets of water down the side of the crock that only let in more air to prolong the struggle. All her cocky self-confidence had drained away. She said so sadly, It took hours and hours. I passed her half my moss. It sat on her skirt in a crumbling lump, but she didn't push it off. I did try to stop him. Once I even went at him with a fork, but he just laughed and called me another little cat who could do with a ducking. He didn't even bother to wallop me. Even after all this time, she sounded a little surprised. He just threw me out of the house and rammed home the bolt. Then he sat with his feet on the table reading the paper, and I had to watch through the window. It took hours and hours. Her spongy, bitten fingertips scrabbled for comfort in the moss. Not hours, I consoled her. Kittens wouldn't be strong enough, honestly. Not hours. Long enough, she said. So ever since then, I've always done it myself. Because it's quicker. And once they're under, I never let them up again. I put my arm around her. No wonder she was so interested in Muriel Brackenbury's horrid death. If someone else had known the horrors of all those thrashings and struggles and beads of air glistening to the surface, maybe she wasn't so alone. I slid off the wall. Taking her hands in mine, I tugged at her gently. Come along, Tulip. Time to go home. Then one day, I heard the office staff discussing her. What has Tulip Pierce done with her hair? It looks as if someone's been at it with the garden shears. They stared out of the window in silence for a while. Then one of them said, She is a strange one, that's for sure. Her colleague sniffed. I can't be doing with her. Bold and sassy if you speak to her. But the minute she wants something from you, she turns into Miss Cute and Mincing. Have you seen her fingernails? They're bitten raw. The nearest one turned from the window. My sister knows the mother, she remarked, just through her dealings with the farm. She says she always gets the feeling that one day she might start screaming and never stop. I wondered who she meant. Tulip's mother? Or Tulip? And was this what the painting was about? Was this why Mrs Miniver and everyone else treated Tulip as if she were as dangerous as one of her own dustbin blazes. Poke a fire, and it flares more fiercely. Everyone knows that. The only safe thing is to stay away. I think I almost came to the decision then, and maybe a dozen other times when I stepped out in early morning air and knew I couldn't face her. On those days I'd skip school myself and spend hours hiding in the palace's abandoned laundry, where my footfalls raised puffs of dust, and I had to sit uncomfortably amid tubs and basins, in the shadow of a giant old mangle, watching a frill of light creep under the door. At four o'clock, I'd make my way out of sight around the palace to the bus stop. After a day in oily gloom, the great bars of sunlight sweeping so cleanly over the fields made me feel tearful and giddy. I'd make sure Tulip was nowhere in sight. Then I'd walk home as usual. 
tulip wore black until it was taken from her. The colour for sweaters in this school is blue. But I'm wearing black for Muriel. Muriel? Muriel Brackenbury. You could tell that the teachers were disgusted. Self-indulgence stretched into morbidity, said Mrs Powell. Mr Hapsley gave her a detention each time he saw her, and as soon as Miss Fowler was told, she stormed down the stairs from her office. Take off that pullover. It's confiscated. But I don't have another one with me. That's your problem, Tulip. Maybe tomorrow you'll wear proper uniform. I found her waiting at the bus stop, shivering. Why didn't you go straight home? I can't. I daren't. She said she'd be phoning my father. So that's how I came to go on my last wild night. This time, it was a shed a mile out of town. I don't know where she'd got the paraffin. Maybe she sneaked it from home. I can't believe the people who owned that chicken farm were stupid enough to leave three whiskey bottles filled with paraffin in a ditch on their own land. Tulip, shh! If you can't help, at least don't spoil things by fussing. Are you quite sure it's empty? You know it's empty. We've walked through it twice. Now pass me the last bottle. The shed went up like nothing I've ever seen. Huge flames licked the sky, and smoke billowed up like a giant black genie freed from a bottle after thousands of years. The fire roared and crackled, rafters collapsed like straws, and the dancing sparks spat and hissed as one by one the empty racks seethed and frizzled. But this time, it was Tulip tugging at my arm. Natalie, Natalie. I shook her off. The only thing I wanted was to stand and watch this great orange dragon leap higher and higher. Natalie, quick or we'll get caught. The police always suspect everyone standing and watching. But though she pulled at me, I wouldn't budge. Why go to all the trouble to raise a fire and then not stay and watch? Why take so many risks, then walk away from all the glorious, spellbinding magic you've created? Why miss the fizzing, crackling glory of something so plain and drab, exploding into fireballs and shooting stars? Oh, please, Natalie, please! She tugged so hard at me, I had to go. But as I stumbled after her, still looking back, I knew I was bewitched. The tulip touch had really got me this time. I knew I'd dream of fires forever and wake in the middle of my dull, dark nights to see the flames she might have lit in me still shooting up to scorch the sky. I'd see whole streets, entire cities burning. I'd switch on my bedside light, and for a while the old familiar pictures on the walls and clothes on the chair might blot out smouldering visions. But I'd be sure Tulip was lying waiting in some bleak bedroom. And I'd know the minute my room was dark again, she'd pick up where she left off and send more of her own imaginings into my boring dreams to set them ablaze with her own growing frenzies. Natalie? Natalie? Are you all right? I heard the whine of a siren. Was it in my head? Or coming from across the field? Down here! Quick! She pushed my head below the level of the ditch and stayed close behind me as we crept along. See that gap? That one. I crawled through the tiny hole in the hedge. She followed and we lay on our backs, panting. I still felt dizzy and strange. And then suddenly, out of the whirl of confusion, came the first inklings of other, darker, more destructive visions. And slowly, slowly, I came to my full senses at last. Is it like this for everyone? Is it unusual to have your life bowling along steadily in one direction, and then, in a flash, change utterly, change everything? For those were the moments when our friendship died. It's as easy as that to pin down. Oh, I let her rattle on, lifting her head to look at the fire engines talking excitedly about 
how fast that old wood flared up and burned. But all the time, I was thinking, people hide in sheds. I'd spent whole days in the abandoned laundry. If someone I didn't know had walked through, I would have held my breath in the shadow of the huge, rusting mangle. And in the tension of the moment, even someone with hearing as good as mine might not have noticed the soft, suspicious splatter of liquid on old trampled straw. And what about Julius? He had a dozen dens. So did his friends. They hid for hours in outhouses so frail and rotten that under the ivy that held them together they would flare up in a moment. Was Tulip mad as well as bad? I clambered to my feet and held out my hand as usual to pull her up. Come on, Tulip. Time to go home. On the bus, she was her old cocky self, flirting with the driver and slyly tipping people's shopping bags over with her feet. Halfway back, she got restless. Want to play all the grey people? Sure, I said. And I did a good job of pretending all the way. But when you've just won the hardest game of all, the others lose their colour. And so my heart wasn't in it, and it fell flat. From the bus stop, we walked together to the bridge. Well, I said cheerfully, see you tomorrow. Why don't I come as far as the palace? I gave her a long look. She really hadn't realised I was out of it. She didn't know that she could never recast the spell. If you like, I said. We strolled arm in arm up the drive. I felt quite calm. I wasn't worried in the least. And that in itself felt strange. It seemed that from the day we'd met, I'd been in thrall to Tulip. Everything I'd said, everything I'd done, had her in mind. Like a tongue to a wobbly tooth, my every thought had come straight back to her. I had become a shadow to my parents. I'd floated out of reach of Julius. I had no friends. I hadn't been there for anyone, except for Tulip. And it was over. All over. I let her walk with me as far as the last bend in the drive. Then, as the palace came in view, I broke away, and dropping my school bag, I ran as fast as I could across the rose garden, under the archway, and down the narrow, twisty path, snaked over with tree roots. I heard her calling, but I didn't answer. I just ran. Stay away from fire. And when I'd reached the middle of the thicket, I came off the path and dived into the bracken. I crawled and crawled. While she was thrashing between the trees, I'd make a little progress. Then when she was perfectly still, cunningly waiting, I didn't move at all. Natalie! Natalie! She was beating so fiercely at the undergrowth with a stick that I got a little further under the cover of her noise, and then even further till I had reached our old mudslide. And down I went, down, down, sideways like a rolling log, faster and faster, until I came to rest in the very deepest bracken. And there I lay, grinning up at the fronds that had closed over my head. She'd never find me now. I was safe in the green dark of jungle, of deep, deep, sunless pools. I lay on my back and listened as she called. Natalie! Natalie! Come out, stupid! It's raining! The first few drops pattered through the whispering fronds. The dripping turned into trickles, but I didn't move. Let her call. Let her search for me. Let her give up and go home. A soft bead of rain ran over my forehead and in my ear, and I recalled Miss Golightly, years before, explaining a picture in assembly. He's pouring the water over the baby's head to put her on the side of light. Tulip crashed nearer, but my heart stayed steady. Go away. I willed her silently, playing the tulip touch backwards for the very first time. Turn around. Go away. 
I don't want you anywhere near me. Not fire. Light. She called a few more times, ever more hopelessly. And then she left. Part 3 It was like coming out of hospital. You don't get straight back into being yourself. It takes a little time. And just as someone with a broken foot gingerly tests it each morning to see how much pressure it can take, I stretched things a little further every day. I had to be careful with Tulip. She was on her guard. What happened on Friday? Why did you run off like that? Oh, I'm sorry. I suddenly felt so queasy. I knew I couldn't make it back to the palace, so I ran off between the trees. Didn't you hear me calling? I was sick. The next day she wanted to come home with me. We've got workmen, I told her, and Dad says he doesn't want any extra visitors. What about the weekend? Oh, there's a special wedding party. We could stay out of sight. No, Tulip. She gave me a suspicious look. I knew how odd it must have sounded to her. She'd never heard me saying no before. You're hiding something, Natalie. No, I'm not. Well, something's going on. I used to be able to come, even when there were special parties and weddings. I let the same look of dumb insolence spread over my face as I'd seen so often on hers. Well, that was last year, Tulip. At this reminder of the game we used to play, she turned on her heel and walked off. I went back to my classroom, grinning. And it was only then I realised that in this small daily probing of sides of myself left too long untested, I'd come across a few things I'd totally forgotten. The feeling of power. The sense of being in control. Mr. Scott Henderson was the first one to notice she was never around. Where's your friend Tulip these days? Have you two had a little spat? I looked unconcerned and lied glibly. Both skills I'd learned from her. Not really. She's got other friends. And soon she had. First, she took up with Marcy, though that didn't last. And after that, she was alone again till someone called Heather started at Talbot Harry's. Like me, all those years ago, she didn't know any better than to offer her friendship to the first person she saw standing alone. And for the next few days, I had to watch Tulip grin at me contemptuously and turn her back and giggle in corners with Heather. But after Tulip tipped the contents of her lunchbox into the bin and filled it with dirt and stones, Heather made other friends. In any case, watching the two of them walk round together arm in arm hadn't made me unhappy. All I could see was how foolish I must have looked when it was me. All I could feel was sheer relief. That was the strangest thing about those weeks, the feelings that I had. Like coming out of a grey, endless dream, I felt the world lift around me. For far too long I'd stayed in Tulip's shadow. Each day now... I felt a bit stronger, and things went better. At school, because I wasn't looking out for her on every staircase and through every window, my work was more careful, and my marks improved. At the palace, I walked more briskly in and out of rooms, no longer endlessly hovering by windows and doorways to see if Tulip was coming. Without half my brain engaged in waiting for her, I became a whole person again. At night... I still dreamed of fires and woke in frights. But in the day, so different did I feel, so little did I want to be the Natalie I was before, that I'd have changed my name if they'd have let me. 
and on the morning I found myself sitting peacefully on the ledge of the veranda, watching the peacocks instead of, one of the games she'd taught me, stalking them till they panicked, I realised for the first time in years that I was happy. Happy. And that's why, when Julius ran round the corner to tell me Tulip was waiting in the rose garden, I didn't want to know. Go back, I said, and tell her you can't find me. Why? Because I don't want to see her. He looked baffled. But then he shrugged and ran back the way he'd come. I felt a little bit guilty, but not much. Staying away from Tulip was getting easier each day. And I avoided her at school as well. I'd have my bag packed by the time the bell rang and hair up Forest Street to catch the bus one stop ahead. I'd keep my head down as it roared past the gates in case she was standing there waiting. It wasn't my fault that she was alone. Nobody forced her to be so horrible all the time, even to people like Heather who had tried to be friendly. Each time she came to the palace, Julius told me off. You can't just keep saying you're busy. Tulip's supposed to be your friend. Just tell her I've gone to Erlingham with Mum. That's not so difficult, is it? It's not that it's difficult, said Julius. It's just that I feel sorry for her. Well, don't, I snapped. It's just a trap. He stared at me as if I'd bitten him. What do you mean? Oh, nothing, I said, getting a grip again. I didn't mean it. But I did. I was sick of feeling sorry for Tulip. I felt she'd caught me young and sucked me in, and even made me bury my own feelings so deep I practically didn't have them. She'd kept me down with her contempt and scorn. But things were different now. It was my turn to feel contempt, and I think I must have realised that part of my growing strength came from despising her because I didn't stop at my new disapproval of her mad habits and her crooked ways. I took it a step further. Now, when we met in the corridors, I'd smile and say hello and mutter something about meeting at break. But at the same time, I'd be taking care to glance at the great lumpy hems on her second-hand school skirt with all the ugly stitching showing through, or at the ragged hair she cut herself, so I could will myself to think, you're nothing, Tulip, nothing. Oh, it was horrible. It was to save my life. But I could weep. She never asked me what was wrong again. Sometimes I found my locker filled with litter, or my name on the commendation list scratched out so hard it gouged the paintwork on the corridor wall. But I kept quiet about it to the teachers, and never said a word at home. Still, even my parents must have noticed she never came. So I was really surprised when halfway through December Dad lifted his head from the Christmas seating plan to say to me, I take it tulips coming as usual. I couldn't work it out at all. I'm not inviting her, I said. He and Mum exchanged glances. Mum fiddled with the gold chain round her neck. But you know how much Tulip loves Christmas. I love Christmas as well, I said stubbornly. And I don't feel like inviting her this year. Dad looked uneasy. But she doesn't have much of a life, does she? So it might be nice. Inside, I was seething. I'd fought so hard to get free. Yet here were both of them, quite ready to throw me back, just to ease their own guilty consciences. They knew as well as I did she hadn't been in the palace for weeks. But how could they feel Christmassy as usual, if Tulip wasn't there, to make them feel even more giving and generous, with Dad feeding her titbits and Mum whispering to the guests, Oh yes, she has a pretty thin time of it at home, so we do try to give her at least one really special day. Well, they couldn't have it both ways. Let Julius invite her, I said slyly. She's really more his friend now. Julius? Mum was so startled, she almost snapped the necklace. Yes, I said. They spend quite a bit of time together now. 
Julius, and tulip. Dad put his hand on Mum's to calm her down. I've never noticed," he said suspiciously. "You're always very busy." He let it drop, but Mum soon slid away to have a quiet word with Julius. I don't know what he said, but why should he have hidden the fact that if he noticed Tulip on his way home from school or saw her hanging round the edge of the cornfield, he always ran across to say hello. After all, he felt sorry for Tulip, didn't they all? So my mean little plan to protect myself worked like a charm. Mum might not bother all that much about me, but when it came to looking after precious Julius, no one else stood a chance. The very thought of having Tulip for Christmas slipped out of everybody's mind, and no one said another word, except Mr. Scott Henderson. At the piano on Christmas Eve, he poked me gently in the ribs. Are you missing her? No. I said sourly, not even bothering to pretend I didn't know who he meant. I do, he said. I've always had a soft spot for your little friend. I could explain to you how to get to her house, I suggested. Then, since you're so fond of her, you could go and visit. That shut him up. He made great play of flicking through his carol sheet. Then, when the singing started, he kept his head bent to the words as if he didn't know them. And never caught my eye again. I sang out, missing Tulip horribly and hating them all. Why should they assume she was my job? Always my job. They all knew where she was. They knew that she'd be sitting in her drab everyday clothes, listening to her mother hum and her father nag as she fingered some horrid cheap present scrimped from what was left of the housekeeping after Mister Pierce finished buying his booze. They all stood round the piano, so smug, so stuffed with food, and so dolled up. What was so wrong with one of them filling a hamper and taking it over, or even bringing her back with them? Come on, Tulip. We know you're not best friends with Natalie any more, but we still care about you. Come with us. But no, that was my job. Look after Tulip, but don't be her hold your coat merchant. Be nice to her, but mind you don't get sucked in too far. Go play with the witch, but don't let her cast any spells on you. Oh, dream on. <laughs> Did she sit there expecting us till the very last minute? Jump in, Tulip. Christmas is Christmas after all. Because after that, there was no more pretending. When we met on the school stairs, she flashed me such a look of hate, and I stared past her coldly. And with no friends, she went from bad to worse. I heard the whispers almost every day. Did you know about Tulip? Guess what she's done now. She hardly came into school, and when she did, she had an air of smouldering anger around her. The boys picked up on it straight away, calling her Crazy Tulip, until the strange frozen mask on her face cracked, and she turned wild and spun into frenzies of violence that had the phones ringing and the male staff running. In February, she was banned from Harry's supermarket. A few weeks after that. The police came into school on her account. No one was sure exactly what it was about, but I realised I'd not known how much trouble she'd been in till I heard some of the guesses. It'll be because of those windows. Don't be soft. The police don't come round for smashed windows. Maybe she had the nerve to go back to Wilkins Hardware <laughs> to nick the batteries she forgot. <laughs> They all laughed. I turned away, embarrassed. Because even after all these months of steering clear of her, some of them still thought of me as Tulip's friend, and so did most of the teachers, because it was to the palace that the police were sent that very same night, pulling their caps off as they walked through the door, 
was ignoring the curious glances from the guests on the sofas. Mum hurriedly ushered them away from reception and threw the door into the office. You stay here, Natalie, she said. Watch the desk for me, will you? The woman officer stood back to let me pass, but the man said, I think we might sort things out quicker if the young lady comes in as well. Really? Mum was astonished, but she didn't argue. Instead, she called George in from the bar and asked him to find someone to cover reception. Now, she said, closing the door behind us all, what's all this about? How can I help you? But they weren't to be hurried. Maria Benson, said the woman, offering her hand to Mum. Stallworthy, said the other, and smiled, though he made no effort to shake hands. They glanced at the chairs till Mum said, oh, Please, do sit down. And then they seated themselves and looked at me. But I'd learnt the blank face from Tulip. I didn't flinch. It's about some little visits, said the woman officer. My heart began to thump. How long can your old life follow you? We couldn't have played little visits for nearly a year. Mum was mystified. Little visits? She turned to me. What little visits? I was so lucky. Before I could put my foot in it, Officer Benson broke in again to try and explain. You see, we're having a little problem with Tulip Pierce. Oh, Tulip. Mum's relief was evident. Tulip, I might have known. And we were wondering if Natalie here could help us understand. I watched them warily, but it was Mum who asked, Understand what? Why on earth she might be doing what she's doing? Mum looked from one to the other. And what's that? The policeman picked at his cap. He seemed embarrassed suddenly and tired. We've had a complaint. It seems Tulip has made three little visits to the family of that poor girl who drowned a while back. She keeps coming up to Mrs Brackenbury's door and knocking and asking her... He stopped and seemed for a moment to be inspecting the plasterwork on the ceiling. Asking her? Mum prompted. He took a deep breath. Asking if Muriel would like to come for a walk. I saw Mum wasn't understanding yet. So did the officer. He tried again. Muriel Brackenbury, he explained. The girl who drowned. Mum's face went ugly with disgust. Tulip is visiting them and asking after their dead child? Standing there on the doorstep grinning all over her face. But that's disgusting. That's horrible. That is the worst, the, the sickest... She turned her anger and revulsion on me. Do you hear this? I hope I never again hear of you spending time with Tulip Pierce. Do you understand what these officers are saying? Officer Stallworthy broke in. That's why we're here, Mrs Barnes. Because when we asked around... We heard that Natalie may know Tulip well enough to help us understand exactly what it is we're dealing with here. Eh? Mum's eyes were flashing. You want to know if Tulip's mad or bad? His tired and embarrassed look came back again. That's not a we put it, of course, but if your daughter... He turned to me. Natalie, can you help us out? Can you tell us what's going on here? Oh, I did an excellent job. I looked so puzzled and anxious. I got more and more distressed. I shook my head and started sentences I couldn't finish. And they must have thought I was being as open and honest as I could. You could see it on their faces. This girl is doing her level best to be some help. But all I let them know through my pathetic stammered confidences was that I'd stopped being friends with Tulip months ago, even before she took up with Marcy and afterwards with Heather. Everyone could tell them that, I said. They could check it. But I told them nothing that they needed to know. 
I hadn't spent all that time building a wall between the old Natalie and the new to take it down now for these two. So I never even tried to explain what was quite clear to me. Perfectly obvious. If I'd been inventing games for two my whole life and suddenly my old partner refused to play, what would there be to do but think up a whole load of new games just for one? And what a game! Here I was, thinking our little visits had been so cool, so risky. And what was Tulip doing? Walking up to the mother of a dead girl and asking if her daughter could come out for a walk. Not just once, but three times in a row. I was awestruck. She'd really left me standing, hadn't she? Here was I, playing little goody two-shoes with mum and dad, and passing tests at school, and even spending hours with Julius. And here was she. And once again, I saw the old bewitching vision of how things could have been. A constant beat of excitement, her hand in mine, and flickering, rising colours, colours to light the sky and warm my grey, grey soul, and fill my dreams for ever. But standing there grinning, they'd said, grinning all over her face, at Muriel Brackenbury's mother. Other people's feelings aren't dice or counters. Three times! Officer Stallworthy took my belated disgust for astonishment, because he said a bit defensively, Well, naturally, the first time, the Brackenbury's thought it must be some horrible mistake. It was only the second time that they rang us, he paused, and we made the same mistake. We just assumed that someone had got the wrong end of the stick. Upsetting, of course, but totally innocent. Again, he stared at the ceiling. But then, this evening... This evening? Incredible! Less than three hours ago, I'd spotted her from the bus as it swept past school. She'd looked the same as usual. But here were these two police officers saying she'd strolled up the path to a house where, for all she knew, half of the county squad cars were lying in wait for her after her first two visits and treated another human being as if she were just part of some game. She's mad, said Mum. There has to be something wrong with her. She's insane. Officer Stallworthy decided the visit was over. He took a card from his breast pocket and, after hesitating between Mum and me, put it in my hand. Any time, he said gently, anything you can think of that might help, anything at all. I nodded. They moved towards the door. Mum signalled me to stay behind, but still I distinctly heard her say, Honestly, I don't know what Natalie ever saw in Tulip Pierce. Perhaps it was her dismissive tone that irritated Officer Stallworthy. Maybe if you're in the police, you get a little tired of people in plushy surroundings telling you how they're above all the squalid little messes you spend your whole life sorting out. Anyhow, he said rather coldly, Perhaps, Mrs Barnes, it's time to start wondering just what it was at Tulips or in Natalie. Mum just ignored the jibe. But to remind him who was supposed to be the villain here, she asked, And what is likely to happen to Tulip now? Oh, we'll speak to her. She won't go bothering them again. The wall I'd built so carefully broke. Not even caring that Mum would realise I'd been eavesdropping, I rushed through the door and caught him by the sleeve. Promise me you won't tell her father! Promise me! Mum looked first shocked, then disapproving. They'll have to speak to Tulip's parents, Natalie. No, please, I begged. They mustn't. If they tell Mr Pierce, he'll kill her. I know he will. Officer Stallworthy said kindly, Don't you worry. We'll take it very gently. I think we all know about Mr Pierce's temper. No! I cried, dragging at him, near hysterical, half dead with fright for Tulip. You don't understand. If you tell him what she's been doing, he'll half murder her. He'll just be glad to have the chance. He'll sound reasonable enough while you're there, but...
but the minute you're gone... The words came searing back from games we'd played together, things she'd said. The minute you're gone, he'll thrash her like a red-headed stepchild. He'll whip her till her freckles sing. They stared at me, appalled. Even my mother was silent. The officers eyed one another, said nothing, and were gone. News travels fast in a hotel. Mum must have spoken to someone, because the very next evening I walked through the lounge to hear the arguments raging around me. Wickedness, Miss Ferguson was saying. Pure wickedness. Nonsense, said Mrs Pettifer. The child is obviously deeply disturbed. Oh, really? snapped Miss Ferguson. It's perfectly obvious that that Pierce girl is malevolent by nature. Part of the problem is that children today hear far too many people telling them they understand all their problems and not enough saying quite openly that some behaviour is downright evil. Old Mr Hearns had probably been hoping this discussion would die away and he'd be asked to play the piano as usual. But now he got irritated and spoke up. Oh, I see. They're bad seeds, are they? Spawn of the devil. She missed his sarcasm entirely. That's right, she said. And when I was a girl, these things were made perfectly clear to us. We even had to learn a little poem. Satan is glad when I am bad. Oh, I know that one. This was Mr. Scott Henderson, who clasped his hands together and started declaiming, Satan is glad when I am bad, and hopes that I with him shall lie in fire and change and awful pains. Hardly a poem, Mr. Hearns muttered critically. But Mum took the chance to stop the argument in its tracks by starting a small storm of clapping. As Mr. Scott Henderson took a bow, Mum leaned over the arm of Mr. Hearn's chair and said softly, I think a tune would be nice now, don't you? Gratefully, he rose and launched into what I've often heard Mum call that awful stale melody of his. Mum kept the smile fixed on her face and nodded to the music. And she was still determinedly humming Bye Bye Blackbird when the grandfather clock took to striking its arthritic half-hour and all of them finally prized themselves out of their armchairs and off their sofas and wandered across the lobby into the dining room. Mum's bright look crumpled like a dead balloon. Leaning her head against the chair back, she closed her eyes. I thought she might call me over to talk about the visit from the police and what I'd said about Tulip's father, but within seconds the telephone outside was ringing again. She waited and waited, and when it was obvious that none of the staff was close enough to take it, she sighed and levered herself to her feet. A few moments later, she was gone. She wouldn't let the guests get into fights, but upstairs she and Dad went at it hammer and tongs. Miss Ferguson's right! Tulip is downright evil! Emma... You know those old biddies down there are light years from knowing the first thing about children. No one is born evil. No one. And especially not Tulip. Mum turned away to tip stale flower water in the sink and run in fresh. I don't know how else you'd explain something so horrible. Oh, don't be so silly. You know as well as I do that Tulip's had such a rotten start in life that it's hardly a surprise she's insensitive to other people's feelings. There's a bit more to this than being insensitive, snapped Mum, slamming the vase back on the table. He reached out to steady it. You know what I mean. To really know right from wrong, you need a certain emotional sympathy, and you only learn that from being treated properly yourself. Tulip's not stupid. 
Tulip knows the rules. Why should she think rules matter? Her fathers are vindictive and willful, and sometimes it must seem to her that whatever she does, she gets punished. So why should she bother about rules? I had to keep myself from turning round. I'd no idea before this argument that they knew so much about Tulip. Why should she bother? Because she's bright enough to see that if enough people like her going round doing exactly what they want, everyone's miserable. If you've been brought up as if your feelings don't matter, you probably assume other people's don't matter much either. In the corner, Julius's computer game chattered to its climax. Mum's voice rose above it. Don't kid yourself, George. Tulip knows perfectly well how much other people's feelings matter, and that's exactly why she does these things. That's the amusement she gets from them. Why else would she do it? Dad couldn't think of an answer. He just shrugged. And then, reluctant to give up his defence of Tulip, he said, Well, you only have to pick up a paper to read about kids a lot younger doing worse. To prove his point, he read Mum a paragraph from the Chronicle lying on the table about the murder of a boy in Elvenwater, where the police were quite sure that the killer was no older than the victim. I don't remember the details. Something to do with footprints and a squabble overheard by somebody pegging out washing, and too many people noticing two young people going down the path, only one coming back. I do remember the police were certain. The one they were looking for was even younger than me. Mum listened, but she wouldn't budge. Children with violent tempers, I can understand, she said. Even children with too few brains to realise how dangerous a game is getting. But Tulip's visits to the Brackenbury's are out of another box entirely. They're not just bad, they're different. And that's what evil is, something different. There's no such thing as evil, you know that. And round and round they went, round and round, while I leaned over Julius's shoulder and pretended to be absorbed in his fast-rising score. Mum had barely begun on the vase on the side table before Dad was arguing with her again. Look, Emma, even professionals come across the odd child they just can't stand. The child they can't help thinking is deeply, deeply mean inside. And then what usually happens is that they meet the parents, and they begin to think... Poor little brute. No wonder the child's such a horror. Oh, right, scoffed Mum. Then I've got a brilliant idea. Why don't you take Mr and Mrs Pierce round to meet Mrs Brackenbury? Then she can start feeling sorry for Tulip. That shut Dad up. See? Mum said, and walked past him into the bathroom, carrying the misting spray. She made a point of letting the door close behind her. The buzzer from downstairs rang twice. Dad pushed himself up from the table. Seeing me watching, he pushed the newspaper over the table towards me and said darkly, Good thing that Tulip has an alibi. It was a joke. But what he didn't know was that, after the paper came, I'd spent a good half hour kneeling on the chest in the passage, scouring the map for elven water, checking the scale, and doing the calculation over and over. Till I was absolutely sure. it wasn't the first time either. Ever since the blaze at the chicken farm, I'd scoured the evening paper every night. As I came in from school, Dad would lift his head from the computer or turn from the rack of numbered room keys. Be an angel, Natalie. Take round the papers. I'd scoop the pile of chronicles into my arms, and round I'd go. Slap, slap. One on every second sofa. Slap. Three on the menu table. Two in the bar two in the coffee room, all the rest in the lounge, except 
for the one I took up to my bedroom. I read the whole thing. Thefts, beatings, vandalism. I dutifully turn each page. Fire injures homeless man. The usual thing. They must print stories like it ten times a week. A garbled account from someone passing by of how he smelled the smoke and saw the flames, and just above, a picture of a burnt-out shed. I try to tell myself a drunk tramp nearly died in a fire, and that was that. Just because Tulip lit fires, it didn't follow that she started this one. But still, she'd be my chief suspect. Sometimes I'd be so convinced that it was her, I'd have to stop and read the report again. Only then would I see the words, Wednesday lunchtime, and remind myself that I'd seen her flouncing into detention at that time. The suspect was male, I'd notice on second reading. The suspect is six feet tall. And who were they, anyway, these people who filled up the pages of the Chronicle, night after night? Were they all like Tulip, living life as one game after another? Tire of one and move on to another even harder and more dangerous? They couldn't all have fathers as vile and bullying as Mr. Pierce, and mothers too feeble to protect them. Surely there weren't that many horrid people in the world. And if there were, I wasn't sure I wanted to go on buses any more or walk down streets for fear of bumping into them. Dad found me in the passage once too often. Each time I see you, he said as he passed, you're kneeling on that chest, studying the map. I was just checking something. Suddenly he stopped and put the television he was carrying down on the floor. Room 302, he said. Don't let me forget. Then he sat on the chest beside me and pushed my hair out of my eyes. Is something worrying you, Natalie? Is there anything wrong? Everyone has choices. I'd shied away from him time and again because close to Tulip, I didn't need him. Tulip's touch was enough. But now she wasn't there. I realised I'd been hiding from both my parents. I'd used the fact that they were busy and Mum was so wrapped up in Julius to slip away from them and keep them off me. And it'd work. If you're a good girl and dress neatly and do your homework, no one will even notice you. You can leave a pretend person in your place to say, good morning, and pass the beans and carry the dishes to the hatch. If they're not looking, then they'll never know. Or... You can raise a hand to save yourself. Make sure they see you. I was just looking at the map, I said, to work out if it could be Tulip who stabbed that old lady on Thursday in Bridleford. He turned to stare. What? I kept my voice steady. But that lady was stabbed and robbed at three o'clock, the police say, and we didn't finish with the school photo till after 2.30, and Bridleford's miles away. I showed him to scale with my fingers. And Tulip has no bike, so I reckon Tulip has an alibi. He shook his head in amazement. But why on earth would you think it was Tulip? Well, tell me, I said. Who are these people, if they're not people like her? Listen he said. This is ridiculous. I know Tulip's turning into a bit of a bad lot, but... I turned on him, accusingly. Miss Pettifer said she overheard someone saying that Tulip's house wasn't a home, just a cold shell keeping the rain off three people. And you've known that for years and years. That's why you never let me go round there, even at the start. Even back then I heard you telling Mum it was... I imitated his stern voice. No fit place for a child. Well then, he said rather smugly, I was right. But Tulip was a child, wasn't she? If you were so sure I shouldn't have been there, then Tulip shouldn't have been there either. Natalie, people can't go round snatching children and giving them other homes just because their parents are awful. She shouldn't have been left, I said stubbornly. He tried to take my hand. You really mustn't think that nobody tried. I know for a fact we weren't the only ones to make a few warning phone calls. And both schools were always well aware of Tulip's background. The Pierces have had social workers round their time and again. 
So everybody was in it. Everyone knew. So what was the matter? I asked sarcastically. Wasn't it bad enough? He rose to his feet and looked down at me. No, he said evenly after a moment. It wasn't bad enough. And I'm afraid that life's a bit like that, Natalie. It has to be a whole lot worse than bad to count as unbearable. Until it gets to that point, people are on their own. I was disgusted. Utterly disgusted. They've got to stick up for themselves, have they? I said scornfully. Manage on their own? He paused, then... Why not? His voice was still even. You've heard Mrs. Pettifer say it often enough. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. And you've even managed it yourself. Look at you. No more warnings on your report cards. No more lost hours after school. Better marks. Better habits. You've let down Tulip. And you've saved yourself. I wanted to scream at him. Yes, but I'm not like you, am I? I've got no power to change things. You lot have. But what would have been the point? He couldn't afford to believe me. None of them could. That way, they'd have to feel as guilty as me. So I didn't say anything. I just nodded at the television he'd left on the floor. Don't forget, I said. You're going to room 302. Oh, right. He took the hint then, and he walked away. And after that, I put Tulip Pierce out of my mind and got on with my own life. This time, I did it properly. I spent my break times in the library, gradually daring to take a seat nearer and nearer one of the small gangs of girls who sat together, till one day Glenys asked if she could borrow my protractor, and Anna told me that she liked my hair. And from then on, I joined them in the lunch queue every day, and walked to the bus stop with Glenys. A week or so later, when she was chatting about the party she was planning at the weekend, she asked me, "'Why don't you come too?' And I was in, at last. I still saw Tulip in the corridors on days she came, and like the rest of them, I took an interest in her foul-tempered brushes with the staff and all her defiant rebellions. Did you hear what she called Mrs Miniver? <laughs> Everyone's saying she'll be asked to leave. My dad heard she'd been reported to the police for slashing the bus seats. It wasn't bus seats, it was theft. Tulip stormed up the staircases and in and out of rooms, snarling at everyone. Move out of the way, idiot! And most of them did. She made almost everyone nervous. I think they all thought that someone the staff could barely pretend to control was far too dangerous even to stand near. The trouble she got in, instead of curbing her, seemed to make her worse. She became more and more insolent, almost insanely cocksure. Indifferent to threats and warnings, even to punishment, she took her continual suspensions in her stride. We'd see her swaggering out between the gates at all hours of the day, and not be able to begin to guess whether she'd been sent home officially or just decided it was time to go. But as her reputation grew, so did mine. In March, I passed all my exams so well, I was commended. Somehow, the harder I worked, the more I enjoyed it. And when, at the end of the year, I won three of the prizes and had to walk across the stage in front of everyone to take my books and shake Miss Fowler's hand, I realised... Tulip and I had now reached equal distinction in our separate ways. Everyone knew me for an excellent pupil, and everyone knew her for a bad lot. And then I bumped into her in the cloakroom. Move over, stupid, she snapped at me, pushing past. Perhaps she'd called me that once too often when we were younger, or maybe, still carrying my brand new prizes, I wasn't ready to be insulted any more. Anyhow, stupid I was. Deliberately, quite deliberately, I let my eyes slide off her face, down her stained pullover, to her puckered skirt, and wrinkled my nose. One look in her eyes, and I knew I'd gone far too far. 
Oh, so we're playing games again, are we? I tried to backtrack. I don't know what you mean. She just ignored me. We haven't played one for ages, have we, Natalie? What do you feel like? Hogs in a tunnel? Havoc? Road of bones? How about watch the skies? You always enjoyed that. I'd never realised eyes could go so hard. Suddenly I felt sick with fright. Leave me alone, Tulip. She made her eyes go wide. That's not very nice, is it? After all, you were the one to start. I haven't started anything. Yes, you have. You just began with stinking mackerel. I saw you. Nobody knows you like your old best friend. There was no point in saying anything. I just made for the door. That's agreed, is it? She called after me. Now it's my turn to choose. I pretended I wasn't listening. Tugging the swing doors to make them close faster behind me, I hurried down the long corridor to get away. When at the corner, I glanced back, she wasn't behind me. But that wasn't any comfort. After all, she had no need to follow me herself. Her menacing little words were doing that. I rushed into the safety of my next class and took my seat, my heart thumping. Nobody looked my way. Nobody noticed. But I sat there, in terror. I knew Tulip. And deep inside, not only did I know that she'd not rest till she'd won the very last game of all, I also knew exactly which of them she'd choose. <laughs> The next few days, I felt like that poor trembling rabbit in Tulip's clutch, waiting for something to happen. But one week turned into two, then three, and Tulip never even glanced my way. And then, at the end of the next week, the holidays started. Time and again that summer, I checked with Julius. You haven't seen Tulip hanging around anywhere, have you? Tulip? No. Why? Is she coming round? I don't think so, but if you see her, will you let me know? I try not to sound worried. Maybe that was a mistake, because once, when I asked him, I got a different answer. I thought I saw her a couple of days ago by the old garages, but when I called her, she just disappeared. Next time, tell me straight away, will you? If you like. I searched the garages, but found nothing. And looking back, I'm not surprised. Tulip was cleverer than that. The days went by. Dad started paying me for little jobs, and Mum needed help in the office, so I was kept busy. Glenis came over once or twice, and I went to her house, and gradually I let myself believe that all Tulip had in mind that day was making me nervous. She knew exactly how faint-hearted I could be. What could be smarter than leaving me to worry week after week about something she'd long forgotten? And so I let myself stop fretting. There was so much to do. When school term began again after the summer, I had a whole lot more work and netball practice twice a week. I got a part in the school play, and what with the flurry of extra rehearsals after half term, before I could believe it, Christmas was on its way again. Are you inviting Glennis? No, I said. She's off to her dad's house. How about Anna, then? She says her mum would have a fit if she went to someone else's for Christmas. Dad shrugged. Makes sense. I wouldn't like it if you were away. So I was there. There in my new green skirt, through all the sherries and the canapes. There through Mr Hearn's Christmas medley on the piano. There through the charity raffle. And there through the carols as usual, 
with Julius bravely singing the first verse of Once in Royal David City, All Alone, and Mrs. Scott Henderson chiming in on every last verse with her ghastly descants, and Mr. Hearns faltering even more than usual because he'd mislaid his glasses. The guests sang out, their faces winking from brightness to shadow, as, through the French windows, the coloured lights along the terraces blinked on and off, on and off, over and over. Oh, clever, clever tulip, to pick the one evening everyone's in the same room and all the kitchen staff who haven't managed to persuade Dad they're not needed are running round in circles or peering into special soups or diving into ovens to check on yet another difficult dish. Clever, clever tulip, to pick the only night no one's around to see a small dark figure pouring petrol and paraffin and God knows what else on all the sills and lintels, all the doors and benches, railings and signs, everything wooden round an old hotel. And clever Tulip, to give herself a good head start, to choose the night when no one is going to notice till it's far too late that the sherry-flushed faces in the firelight are blinking pinker and brighter, pinker and brighter. Alarms went off as the first flames broke through. The sprinkler system Dad put in the year we came spun into action at once. Everyone did the right thing. Nobody panicked. The guests, as Mum said afterwards, were marvellous, marvellous. They gathered on the lawns and ticked each other off on lists as though they'd been in fires all their lives. No one sneaked back inside to fetch their jewellery. No one played daft heroics for the cat. And though Cedric had to be dragged away from the oven in which his berth en croute were crisping up nicely, all the kitchen staff switched off their grills and their gas jets in an orderly fashion and left immediately through the nearest doors. So by the time the first of Tulip's carefully primed explosions shattered the glass in the conservatory, everyone was safely out, watching the flames take hold. And if she hadn't thought to dig away the leaf mould of a hundred years, to drag closed the giant iron gates at the bottom of the drive, and loop them round with so many chains and padlocks that the firemen believed her when she called out to them, No, not these gates, the other ones, round there! Then the first fire engine wouldn't have got bogged down in the muddy lane leading to their farm, and the second one would have broken in just that much quicker. And so the palace burned. Julius and I stood side by side to watch. His face flared in the fire's dancing light as one dark framed window after another burst into a fierce glow. He turned to me, his cheeks burning as much with excitement as the reflection of the flames. Was it Tulip? My face was probably as flushed as his as I began the long, long lie. Now how on earth should I know? Cheerfully, he turned back to the blaze to watch the firemen send their huge coils of water snaking over the parapets, like Tulip's stolen gold necklace hurled in the rubbish drum all that time ago. They slithered into the building's giant shell and vanished instantly. I wondered, was she watching too? How did it feel? to see the only place she ever loved go up in flames. Inside, the dimpled copper bar top she used to stroke was buckling and melting. The glorious curving banisters she trailed her fingers up a million times were twisting to ugly shapes as they charred. Did she care? Was she hidden up somewhere in a tree behind us, just like one more roosting peacock crying her eyes out? Or had she simply laughed? and run off home for yet another beating for being late. Dad came up behind and rested his hands on our shoulders. He couldn't say a word. He just stood there and watched. And so did Mum. We stood in silence as the palace gradually gave up the fight, and out of the deafening, hissing and spitting and crackling and roaring, the silent billows of smoke curled away in defeat over the huge dark spinney where Tulip had crept to hide her dangerous little toys 
week after week, till she was ready to play the very last, very worst game of all. So now we're off. Tomorrow we leave for Nettle Underwood, the Starbuck Arms. Dad's pretty cheerful about it. Sometimes you think that Tulip had done him a favour. These grand old buildings like the palace have had their day, he keeps telling everyone. Too many planning rules. Hotels that size can't stay afloat with just a few loyal regulars and passing tourists. These days you have to be really up to date. Health centres, swimming pools, a proper dance floor, lifts to every floor. They've got all those at the Starbuck. Mum's come to terms with losing so many things. She had a weep about some photographs that were ruined, <laughs> mostly because they were ones of Julius, I expect. And there were a couple of phone calls with the insurance people that left her shaking with rage. But yesterday, she looked round the mess and clutter in the room where she's dumped all we have left and said to me, Nothing worth dusting. Nothing worth bothering about. Come for a walk with me, Natalie. Let's go and have coffee together in the village. And no one there minds much. Drinks at the hotel were always too expensive for most of the people round here. And the company's selling the site to someone who wants to build nice modern houses. So they don't mind either. They're not blaming Dad. After all, he's never made a serious mistake before. And though an accidental fire should have been stopped at the outset, everyone's agreed that arson's another matter. I worried terribly about Julius. But it turns out he doesn't care a hoot. He won't say anything in front of them, but to me he's admitted it. He enjoyed the fire. Brilliant, he calls it. He's become famous at school, describing it over and over. And though we're leaving now, he says he never wanted to move on to Talbot Harry's anyway. He's glad he's going to another school. And so am I. Everyone needs the chance to start again. Though I was doing pretty well, it seems. I know, because on Friday Miss Fowler called me in to show me the report she's sending on to Nettle Underwood. After a period of confusion, Natalie Barnes has made a prodigious effort to find herself. She should go on to better and better things, and we all wish her well. I told Glenys we were leaving, and promised her that I'd write every week. But if I'm honest, I'll miss her less than the stone boy in the lily pond. She's never been a close friend. Not like Tulip. I don't think I'll be seeing her again. Her name comes up the whole time, of course. What with the gossip about the police inquiry and the probation officer's report. Mum calls her that witch Tulip. And Dad says, nonsense, Emma, every time. But I can't help but think that being a real witch would have been better for her. At least that way she'd have a little power. Tulip's got nothing now. Yesterday, when we were packing, Julius asked me, If you could rub Tulip out of your past life, would you do it? And I had to shake my head. I can't regret the times we had together. Sometimes I worry I won't have times like that again. That there will be no lit nights, no incandescent days. But I know it's not true. There can be colour in a million ways. I know I'll find it on my own. I have strange dreams about her. Sometimes the two of us are sitting cross-legged in one of the outhouses behind her farm, stirring a liquid we call flame water, or crawling on our bellies through an orchard trying to set fire to the flowers. But mostly, when I dream, Tulip and I are back in our first school, giggling and being silly, or lying on our backs behind the parapet our bare arms touching, playing Watch the Skies. I think about the day that Dad and I first saw her in that field of corn and try to tell myself it was already too late. There's no particular moment when someone goes to the bad. Each horrible thing that happens makes a difference, and there had probably been too many of those already in Tulip's life. But I can't convince myself. Yes, now I know that, even back then, Tulip was going off to drown that poor kitten. But Dad was no older the day he pushed his grandfather's tortoise under the bush and left it there to die. You could say that Tulip was braver and kinder. 
and people aren't locked doors. You can get through to them if you want. But no one did. No one reached out a hand to Tulip. Nobody tried to touch her. I hear them whispering, and they sicken me. Bus seats, grumbles Mrs. Bodell. Lock of doors, complain the teachers. Chicken sheds, say the farmers. Greenhouses, dustbins, moan the neighbours. And Mum says, a lovely old hotel. But what about Tulip? I shall feel sorry for Tulip all my life. And guilty too. Guilty. Guilty.